you know, um, but daily I received um Boyer's um commentary a bit late. I normally um listen to the commentaries and assess them that I can give a breakdown. But I have to think on my feet this afternoon where Dwyer is concerned. And you know, this sad thing about um the situation, Dwyer commentary is right on point and it's it's highlighting some stuff. But what I would like Dwyer them to understand, right, is now that we have the situation where the bullets in heads, it's hurting the nation because everybody knows this guy against OJ and it's painful to them. But the white collar crimes with these politicians that they support and are free to, to call out for their wrong and their thievery and all of these stuff, all of those are crime to you know. The people on social media with these fake profile that is out there bashing and creating all this kind of stuff, those are things to you know. When those people mash up your farm in Nevis and you came out, up to now, the general public have not, in my view, done anything to assist you in restoring your farm. You know, all those are criminal activities, you know. It is not just somebody putting a bullet in somebody's head. There's too much criminal activities and the Federation of St. Kitts Nevis, where people are just quiet unless it affects them directly. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that up because. I, I found I, the, the commentary itself, this is the first time I'm hearing it. And it's a kind of Johnny come lately commentary, um, a sort of fix it all for something that has been ongoing for, like you said, 40 plus years. These things didn't happen in a vacuum. These things have been building because of circumstances 30, 20 years ago. He intimated something that is very important that you know, the conveyor belt of youngsters coming through the system right now, um, the antisocial behavior, they are recognized early in the child's upbringing. The question you have to ask yourself as a society, what have we done to arrest and kind of uh, redirect those energies away from antisocial behavior? It's something more positive, you know? And, and so to come now and say, you know, uh, all these, these hyperbole, all this blood and guts and all kind of things on the road, and right, like they said, the, the, the whole of society approach, to can't be going after gangsters and not going after politicians and people commit co corruption. Sometimes the harm they do is even more worse than the, than, the, than the murder that we see on the road. The murder is very visible, it's very you know, emotional, um, very public, you know? Um, and so we have a reaction to it. And that's normal, it's a human reaction, you know? But um, the, the idea that somehow you go and hang these people that you're gonna stop the murders. Look at countries where they have murders, whether it's by firing squad or hanging or any other lethal injection, has it stopped murders? No, if people are gonna commit murders, they're gonna commit murders. The problem, the, the question you have to ask yourself, how do we prevent persons from going down that path? What are the mechanisms we have in place what are the safety nets we have in place to prevent the antisocial behavior taking hold in a society? The society, and rightly said by him, we are deteriorating as a society. We have no regard for, for uh, property. We have no regard for civil discourse. Uh, we have no regard for um, persons who've been victimized. You know, once it's been done on a, on a particular platform, you cannot separate one from the other. If I'm a gangster going around looking to kill people and you come to me with this moral argument about why are you killing people? Well, I'm gonna to say to you, well, what about the guy over there who's stealing a million dollars and people are starving because the, the, the dollar is not there to, to feed the children? You know, the, the arguments we made at every level, you know, but the point I'm trying to make is you cannot and will not solve this problem, this latest spate of violence. You cannot solve it by going after these gangsters as if there aren't young gang gangsters coming up right behind them. You listened to an interview by the, the police the other day on Freedom, I think a couple of months ago. And they were saying when they interviewed these young guys from the primary schools, they're saying they want to be gangsters because they see how the gangster's lifestyle is. As young as nine and 10, as eight, as the officers indicated. These young people have already set their sails that this is a life for them. 
How are you gonna stop that from happening? When, as he indicated, so many, so many of the children are coming to school, into high school, reading below grade level. You end up in a situation where you, you flock together as a group because all of you have fallen through the cracks. And that is essentially what is happening. It's a failure at the beginning of these children's lives, not at the middle at the end. That you either gonna pay in the front or you're gonna pay in the back. I would much prefer to pay at the primary school level to make sure we have equal access to education, make sure we have our children properly educated, make sure there are programs for children to be, to be enrolled in, in the during school, after school, specific programs for specific issues. You're gonna pay there, but it's, I prefer to pay there than pay at the back end when our youngsters end up in prison or dead. Yeah, for sure. But you know, um, Dr. Daly, what, what, what is funny for me, like I was saying earlier, I, does not, I do not believe in violence. I don't believe in the killings and whatever the case might be. But growing up in St. Kitts, I used to question myself, what, why would someone, how could someone look at another individual and take a life? without um thinking yeah. right but but a daily as i became an adult you know there are some people that have done some stuff to me that i would not think twice about taking their life you know <laughs> if it wasn't for my family who will exactly. end feeling it more than me if it was just for my satisfaction i will shut down those people so it's a holistic approach that we need from the community because partner you're going to tell me that we had a government inside there seven years ago. You had three parties in that government. We had the People's Action Movement led by Sean, the People's Labour Party led by Timothy, the farmer hog, and the CCM, the Council of Citizen Movement led by Baby Bantley. And that was in there for seven years doing all manner evil. Many of us, I can't speak because I reach out to them about what I'm saying. And what was the response? Ignore the noise. Mm -hmm. When they attack, they study them. Mm -hmm. This is the best thing it's a Navy's relation has ever been. Mm -hmm. And then guess what? You come out and you cuss the hell out of the Labour Party. You cuss the hell out of Douglas. You're supporting Pam. And then you come back now and you're hugging up the Labour Party. Now you and your opposition party is fighting, opposition fighting opposition. Even in this recent situation, opposition with the killing, opposition fighting opposition. But if my boy Dwyer and these um, pundits, Sam Kander and Dr. Martin and them that is out there and social media will use their time to call a wrong a wrong. The bad boys the more that is learning from these politicians and being upset that the politician and getting away with it, getting the money and they're not getting anything. They're reacting, you know. Of course. They're reacting to that, you know. That's exactly because what is going on in Navy is there is a criminal act, you know. Exactly. There's a criminal enterprise running the government of Navy. Everybody knows that. It's a criminal enterprise running the government of Navy. And how can you then ask persons who are, you know, the antisocial type of people to, you know, lay down your guns, don't, don't assault anybody, don't thief anything, behave yourself, when all around them, the politicians are getting richer and richer by the day. So whether they do it at the point of a gun or the point of a pen, wrongness is wrongness. You can't call out one because it's more physical and in your face. And the other one you simply ignore. People are stupid. People see the wealth that is being flaunted in this country. People see who has the wealth in this country. And they're saying, well, I mean, I'm not sophisticated enough to get it that way, but I know I can get it this way, the way I know. And so what you see happening, like you indicated, persons are weighing and, and measuring and saying, I want mine too, and I want it now. Yeah. 
you know something you know something brother daily <laughs> i'm not hitting these events because god knows that the country needs some um life and they need some income but i look at the events that they call um breaking down and i mm. said to myself these bad boys out there and decide who might not have the clothes i have the money to go to breaking down uh to go to tropics and live the kind of lifestyle that they see happening it's only a matter of time they're gonna make their own breaking down you know they're gonna break it down in their own way you know and well, it, it didn't take a week it happened you know you you realize i'll tell you something the, the, no doubt those events and the sequence of them and, and the frequency of them, sorry, is causing a stretch on people's resources. But I believe a lot of the crime that's happening right now, especially petty crime, the last knees, the robberies, the break-ins, a lot of these are survival. These are guys who have no skill sets, no, no uh, way to get a skill set worth, mark, worth marketing. And so they, they take up what they know best. They sit among themselves, they, they, they get among themselves and they say, listen, I gotta eat. I gotta sleep somewhere. I need housing, I need a car. And I'm gonna take it from people who have. Because all my life, nobody's ever given me anything. I had a hard break in school. I never learned anything. But take a look seriously, uh, DJ Marshall. Look at who is the one, look, look, look at who are the ones who are going to prison. These are the guys, the same guys we are describing. The guys who did not finish at any level at high school, the guys who fell through this, the, the, high school, the education um, net, guys who could not get a skill, trade or, skill or trade um, so they can earn an honest living. They have to survive somehow. So whose fault is it that they didn't get all these things? Their parents' fault, society's fault, the government's fault? When I was growing up, and I'm certain you probably recall the same thing, there was a truancy officer. Going to school was not an option. Taking a day off was not an option. They would come looking for you. Mr. Newton, yeah, Newton was the truancy officer for, for Nevis that I know of, Charleston in particular. And if you were seen on the road at any point in time beyond what's where you should be in school, you had to be picked up and, and answered for that. Now you see kids dragging themselves to school, nine o'clock, 9.30, as if they, you know, where am I going? You know, the programs that NRP had in place to try to arrest some of these antisocial behavior, the reading starts with you, the after-school reading program, the homework assistance program, you know, that helped our youngsters, the, the, the training, skills training in Trinidad for many of our youth at risk, male and female, all those programs came to a crashing end in 2013 when CCM took over government and they have not been replaced. So you have a situation where the schools are failing our children for whatever reason. And then you have a society run by a government that's also failing our, our people because they have taken away those little safety nets, those skill sets that allow them to find themselves a good paying job and therefore able to support, this, support themselves and their families. If you do not take a serious look at how we are, um, for lack of a better word, engineering our young people coming through the, the primary school right now. This crisis will continue. And no amount of threats about hanging or capital, capital punishment is going to change that because the dynamic is people have to survive and they will do it with whatever skill set they have. Our job is to make sure they have the requisite good skill sets to make themselves valuable valuable members of society. Yeah, um, Brother Daly, um, I'm happy that my good friend here, Brother Dwyer Astafan, he is listening to the program as usual as he does weekly, and he is weighing into our conversation. And I really want to thank him for that and appreciate him because I know we have had several conversations in, in this regard in the past. And I know during his time as a minister of government, he has presented stuff that he said was not a hate to. So this is what he just sent to me. He said, Brother Jeffroy, my reference to these violent acts does not mean that I am not concerned um, with white collar crimes. Indeed, I've been quite vocal on that for many years. I presented a plan 
to the to the uh, I guess the whole cabinet um, ministers, it was ignored. What I am saying today in today's commentary is not new, and it's also not intended to contain all the solution, all of the solutions. And again, I think we are saying the same thing um, in a sense, in a nutshell, Dwyer. And it is unfortunate that you're not here to have this conversation with me. Um, I know you sent out a notice that um, you um, closed your office this week and whatever, so I decided really not to bother you and disturb your vacation. But at your convenience, we could continue this conversation. But the, the, the bottom line is here, is that though um, Dwyer may have spoke about the white color situation previously, it is more rampant now in the last seven years. And even most of it was taking place at the hospital wing in Nevis. And, yeah. you know, I'm going to play this clip. I was going to go to the prime minister's um, address, but since we're on this topic, I, you know, just say when you shake the tree, sometimes some of the green limes fall off and leave the, the yellow ones. Mm. Take a listen to this clip. To date, the hospital wing, the new hospital wing, it has not been completed as yet. Um, we are still awaiting word on that. The Premier recently alluded to the fact that there has been, again, some delay. And I think at, at this point, really, because of the funds that has been exhausted on that particular hospital wing and the fact that we are still waiting, we are still waiting a fully functioning or completed hospital wing, I believe that there is no perhaps need for consultation um, with the general public to just let people know directly, not necessarily through a press conference, but more so um, through community outreach to more community consultations or public consultations so that people can ask questions. And of course, as taxpayers, and I, I wish to remind everyone that property tax is due, so you have to pay your corporate tax, property tax, whatever have you. So as taxpayers, I believe that we do have a right to demand certain answers and to ask certain questions of the government. So I think the time has come for the government now to be honest, to be open and to be frank with the general public because what is happening really doesn't make sense. Of course, we have been hearing, you know, a number of things um, back in the budget debate in, in, um, in February there was a disparity as to the amounts that has been spent on that particular hospital wing i mean at this point you know would i think the majority of the public has already concluded that there has been some sort of wastage of government funds and i think the time has come for the government really to be honest and to be open and to be frank with the general public and to have some sort of consultation to let us know what really is the problem because clearly there must be a problem okay we have been given a number of excuses a number of reasons there were some issues with the design um issues with the budget issues with the 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 interior design we are now told that that is being worked on now we understand that there has been a, a halt um and so i think the time has just come it's too much confusion to just be honest open and frank with the members of the general public and just state really what is the issue what was the issue from inception and why this particular project you know is uh, is beyond the due date and is taking so long okay nothing beats um honesty nothing beats openness nothing beats being frank and i think the general public the taxpayers really deserve that okay so brother daily after months of cussing for asking for some um justification and some clarity on the and the hospital wing the independent candidate finally on monday evening um came out in a soft way and asking for baby brantley to come to the public finally what's your view on that well i'm telling you something the the message is only as good as the messenger and this messenger has no credibility to talk about honesty or uh, openness or transparency. 
but I'll take it as, let's take it as that. Um, the issue of the hospital, of course, is a severe one. Um, I mean, 19 million spent or thereabouts. And we are nowhere closer to completing this, this uh, monstrosity than we were four years ago. Recommendations have been made to start over, to actually break it down, not by me, but by consult consultants they hired. They said, listen, there's so many faults. There are so many faults with this construction, with this unit, it'd be cheaper to just simply break it down and start from scratch. But let us, be before we jump into all that, let us go back to the beginning. How did this evolve to where it is? How did Spencer Brand, who was then contesting as a candidate for Nevis Wands and Paul's, how did he manage to land a contract of this importance, of this significance, of this value, without any tendering process being rendered at all, handed to him on a silver platter? That is the height of corruption, insider trading, as you may call it. There was no tendering. There is no, there is no profile of Mr. Brand that says he is competent to deal with a matter of this nature. So those are two things that went wrong very early. How did Spencer Brand get the contract and was awarded over a million plus dollars for design that has cost the government millions more to try to correct? Nobody seemed to be addressing that from the beginning. And that has to be the beginning, the beginning of the conversation. What was the role in the federal government in, over, in trying to make sure whatever funds that were handed to the NIA were properly spent on projects such, such as this? You simply cannot say, oh, well, it's the NIA fault. No, I wash my hands. No, you were handed the money. The government should have had oversight to make sure the division public was protected. Nobody did anything. If you look back again with the same NIA, when Mr. Brand was given $120 million CBI project, the Atlantic View Hotel over the Encock Sea, orchestrated through the cabinet, the federal cabinet of team unit government. Who on Sinkis was raising any flags about this? When we spoke about the fact that as a minister of energy here on Nevis, minister responsible for Nevlek, that the law firm of Daniel Brandling Associates has a retainer charging the people of Nevis $8,000 a month to be the legal representative of a statutory corporation of which he is the minister in charge. When we spoke about the fact that the legal advisor pays rent to property owned by the premier. Nobody paid attention to that. When we spoke about the unbiased matter over there in St. James, where the matter ended up in court and the judge admonished Premier Brantley, asking him, well, who are you really representing? Yourself or the people of Nevis? This is in a court document. I didn't hear any outcry from anybody on St. Kitts. When we spoke about all the shunning of the guns that went on the electoral office, all the corruption that occurred during elections, where money was being spread about to win the election, I didn't hear any commentary about this coming from St. Kitts. We have selective outrage. That's what we suffer from in St. Kitts and Nevis. Selective outrage. When everything is tied in and everybody's watching and say, well, if they can do this nonsense, I can do my own thing. I can do my hustle the way I want to hustle it. So we cannot be talking, we cannot be hypocrites with our, with our criticism, um, DJ Marisha. We have to be honest with our criticisms, right? And, and, We've been asking for, for an audit. The government in St. Kitts has been in place now for 10 months. We've been months. asking for an audit of the accounts of all the projects that were funded by, by SIDF. Nothing is forthcoming. So don't, don't get me started. Well, I started here, you know, I, you know, there was some tractor back in the days. Remember, there was some patter patter you had to push them down a hill to start? <laughs> yes. Okay. We had one in St. Paul's, Martin used to drive, eh? and it would park up the hill by us. And we had to deal with that. 
because as you're speaking there, my, my brain is going in, off, in overtime because while you're speaking about those things, my mind reflects back on the kids with this lady, I understand she's a Russian, that when they was training for um, track and field on the beach, who lie down across the, 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 the beach to stop the kids from running on the sun. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there was some investigation in that. I haven't heard anything about it since. There was no I, investigation. I, I also heard the, the, the baby Brantley, because that's what he is. I don't recognize him as the premier in the things he's doing to Nevis. I heard him last week in some comment. I don't know whether it was a press conference or if it was one of his rant and his um, Andemark program. But he's speaking about um, Russian getting passport and whatever, whatever. Is he got the Russian name in Navis now? <laughs> Boy, let me tell you something, right? This guy is what you call a transactional premier. There's always something in the pot for him. Either him is directly, his, his wife, through her real estate company, or through Daniel Brandt and Associates. There's always something in the pot for him. And when you see pundits on St. Kitts who wish for Brandy to continue, what kind of respect can I have for them? What kind of respect when they endorse Brantley and his nonsense about he's the best thing since life been for Nevis? And we here on Nevis are stuck in salt because of the level of corruption and badness in this man. How can I have respect for them? And they don't know who they are. They tacitly, overtly support him as if we are a bunch of fools up here and we don't know the difference between good and bad. And so when I hear commentary of, of, from, from pundits, I have to really shake my head and wonder what planet are they living on? Because you cannot be selective. You have to be out there as being neutral in your, in your commentary when you have to, but you can't be picking sides and pretend that you're not picking sides because we're not foolish. We see what's happening. We know who our friends are. We know who are trying to maintain this dynasty with, with Brantley. We know that for whatever reason. And so I, I, take, I take commentary very seriously, um, DJ Moesha. And for me, messengers are just as good as a message. If, if I do not believe that you are being judicious, that you're being sincere, that you're being authentic in your commentary, just words put on paper. I don't even listen anymore to you because your, your, your selection, your, your, your practice selective in your critiques and your criticisms while we know deep down, you know, who you really are. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate that we, we are having this conversation and whether they want to accept it or not. This white collar crime tied right into the guns and, and whatever is taking place in Africa, these folks, like I say, they are paying attention. I'm going to go on to the uh, geothermal. And mm. again, I'm not expert with the geothermal, but I'm pretty sure you guys in Nevis have heard enough of it because I heard so much version. I heard there was uh, drilling in 2017. I think I heard last year there was rigs that was um, uh, supposed to be on its way to Nevis by December. I didn't see any rigs. I, um, the latest thing I heard was that um, there was waiting on a letter from the, the, the former prime minister that wasn't signed, that was now signed by this prime minister. And then in January, they spoke about drilling. Will, the project will start in June. This is June, almost halfway through. So let's listen to these clips because they said I got receipts, you know, but all I have is receipts, nothing but receipts. So, <laughs> you know, let's listen to them. Ben Bart from SKN Newsline. On the geothermal project, um, I don't know if you spoke about it, but. Um, can you just give me a quick in, uh, update on what's happening and what's going to happen for the rest of the year? Okay. The geothermal project, um, the, we had a meeting last week, I would want to think it was Monday on, on, on this, with NEVLEC, which is the executing agency, and uh, the bidding process has come to a close. Uh, I'm advised that over 30 companies expressed an interest in the project. But Nevlek has explained that initially when they put it out to tender, they put it out in parts. Uh, let me try to explain it this way. If we're doing this building that we're now in, 
rather than putting out a tender for the entire building. They put out a tender for the foundation, for the block work, for the roof, for the air conditioning, for the electrical, etc. Different pieces. And Let me stop there for a bit, brother. Um, Dr. Daly, hmm. you, have you built a house of your own in Nevis? Yes. Did you just go out and get an estimate for the foundation and then come back and get one, get one to put up the brick? Of course not. It is, it is, this, the conversation, this man, he has run out of lies. He has run out of room. The alleys, the, 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 the alleyways are closing in on him. And he's run out of, 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 of um, explanations. Um, you know, right now, he doesn't know what to say anymore because this conversation has been had since 2013. In 2015, they, formed, they, they signed a power purchase agreement with Nevis Renewable Energy International out of, out of Texas. They're the same ones who brought in a drill rig to drill those wells in 2017, which everybody know are now famous. The, wells, the well has since been condemned by both ECB um, and by the, the CEO of Nevlik as being unusable. So millions spent, no accounting for that. But he went on to speak about the fact that the government is now in the process of acquiring or seeking to acquire land. Stand, stand, join. St stick up in, stick up in. And so they said they had four different components for the project that they put out. And therefore, the 30 plus companies, some of them were specialists in only one of those areas. So, for example, going back to the example I used for this building, some people showed interest, say, well, okay, we do roofs or we do AC. So they showed an interest in the AC component of it. They later change, that is Nevlek, and they asked for a single bid on the entire project. On the understanding that whoever the successful bidder was could then subcontract out to others for various components. And a lot of those companies therefore fell away because even though I'm a specialist in air conditioning, doesn't mean that I know how to do foundation or the roof. So this sort of reduce the number considerably. And I'm told that at the end, three companies bid on the entire project. They're evaluating these bids, and we hope to have a result, I'm told, by the 30th of June. That's the date that they've given to me in terms of completing the evaluation and having a position that we could come to the public with in relation to that. Um, we are told that that um, they're looking at drill rigs and that we know that some drill rigs are available. Um, some one rig that we're aware of could be available as early as December and another available as early as January in the coming year. And so we anticipate that if there's to be drilling, which we expect, that it won't happen on towards, until towards the end of this year. Having said that, Mr. Bart, I would want the public to understand that there's no. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the, the, the idea that you, you mentioned, the question you asked, you asked me earlier, is a very significant question. And it can't be downplayed. The fact that they're talking that they have put out, they were allowing persons to be on part of the project. I've never heard of such nonsense in my life. Nonsense. You're going to build an AC for a, an, or, or the foundation work or whatever you're going to you can be able to put in the glass and the windows. I mean, this is nonsense. This is cool, but it's nonsense. You, you put all the contracts out, you put out the, the bids, people bid on them for the entire plan. You can then some contract out as the, as the winner of the bid to whatever component you can handle. That's how it normally does. Who does it like this? So you have 10 contractors on the site, it doesn't make any sense. But, this is but, but remember, remember, he came out bragging to so people, flash it, fl flooding the the place yeah, to be to be this project. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't I doubt in the entire world there are 30 companies that do drill um geothermal drilling. Come on. But, but the, the other part that is coming up that is really mind-boggling for me. You yeah. have been talking about doing geothermal God knows for how long. But it's only now you're thinking about acquiring lands that yeah. is required for the project. Take a yeah. listen. Take a listen. I mean, these these clips are not for you and I. You and I know the facts. These are for the online viewers and for those folks out there that want to pop up baby band through these lives. Some work to be done. There's some lands in the area to be acquired. 
there's some road works to be done to put in the road because when the jewelry comes it will need to be able to traverse a particular pathway to get to the site and then those individuals who have lands in the immediate vicinity of the drilling we're trying to acquire those lands so as to make them a part of the project as opposed to having people having lands right next to the project uh, those lands in terms of noise and uh, drilling and all the, you know what comes from drilling uh, we feel that it, it will be better for those lands to be in the possession of government and so we're trying to negotiate now with the landowners to acquire those lands in that immediate vicinity and we're talking about the Hamilton area so those landowners have been contacted negotiations are ongoing with them the third piece of that puzzle is water because the drilling is going to require additional water so when I spoke to water earlier I spoke to water in the context of our water supply for our consumption but we're also going to have to get additional water for the drilling and so we are hoping to start drilling for water very soon to feed into that timeline as well. But when we drill, the drilling for water is going to satisfy both the geothermal project and the water needs for the people of Nevis. Bear in mind that we have invested significantly in Nevis in a massive upgrade for our storage and distribution of water. So we had a massive project. If you go around the island, you see these massive tanks, new tanks, and we have upgraded all of the the um, infrastructure. So in Nevis now you don't get what people used to get where you just get a low pressure so you get a low trickle of water that doesn't happen anymore and wherever we're doing roads on the island we upgrade the water infrastructure at the same time. So Bath Village, Butlers, all of those projects we've upgraded the water infrastructure but upgrading your distribution and storage doesn't answer the question of additional water. So we tried to answer that initially with the treatment plant at Hamilton that has not proven enough, so we are now going to go to other wells plus this small desal plant, which, as I said, is a pilot project. Now, partner, talking about lands, did not they had drilling at that area before to to for, to to, um, to look for whatever they were looking for? But they actually drilled on the site already. So when he start using fancy words to confuse the public about having access roads to traverse uh, the, the terrain. I mean, I mean, you're talking bullshit in, in the Queen's English. Forgive my language, but th that's the way it is. I mean, there was a road. It had to be in a road to, got, to, to have gotten a drill rig down there in the first instance in 2017. There must have been a road there, right? He talked about the, the acquiring lands, adjoining lands, so that persons who own property there wouldn't be, be affected by the drilling activities, etc. This matter of geothermal has been on the front burner, back burner, front burner, back burner, front burner again, since 2013. They signed a power purchase agreement, my friends, in 2015. That's eight years ago from today. So now you're talking about acquiring lands because you don't want to disturb people and building a road to trans traverse the terrain and to have water available for, we all knew this was a, was, a, was, a, was a situation all along. It's not new that you needed to do these things. Why are they now entering into negotiations? It tells you, David DJ Marshall, all the talk from 2013 until present before CDB came into, into view was pure fallacy. It meant nothing. He was making his money from the legal um, work done by, on behalf of NREI. He was making his money from whatever else. Everybody's go to hell. They, he could not have been serious. His government could not have been serious about geothermal if they're now entering into negotiations to, for, for the, with the landowners and to talk about having water available for the production wells. It is nonsense. It is nonsense. Yeah, this is the kind of things that, you know, all those pundits and sinkers you know, we're talking about, take, well, take, take taking apart part of this thing. It's very contradicting. And one thing I can say, even recently on this program, I had Janice 
the Honorable Dr. Janice Daniel had she some kind of was here in Dwyer. And Dwyer was taking Janice to task that geothermal will never be realized on Nevis. And Janice why, feel like- Why, why, it, don't, it, he take, why don't he take Brantley to task? Well, that's why I asked him the question, but Brantley say he can't come here. Um, this is not a, 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 love, a, a love site for him. He, he don't want to take on the, the task. Because I would like to hear Dwyer speaking to Brantley about, um, about the geothermal. Because I know by the end of that interview, him and Dwyer will fall out. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I actually, I actually, I will, uh, I will put money on that. I actually reach out to Dwyer and um, I ask him to reach out to Mark. I told him, since he's of the opinion that geothermal will never be realized, and Nevis and Janice and Mark, David Brantley, to be exact think that it will. I, I gave him the option. I said, um, invite, invite baby Brantley to, to, to um, debate Janice and this program. You will be the, um, the moderator. I, I will be a moderator as well because I have to control the system, you know? And uh, he, 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 he reached out to Mark and Mark said so he would debate Janice but not on this program. So <laughs> I, I, I'm still waiting for it to be scheduled for another program. Maybe it might be done on Van Radio. I do not know, but I would like Dwyer to be the moderator. I, I don't have a problem looking on. But mm -hmm. all of this nonsense, it takes me into that um, statement at the press conference. I think that was last month, the 30th, the last press conference he had, the one I just played. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back to January 26, speaking about the same geothermal. And listen to what David Bentley told the reporters then on January 26 of this year. In relation to geothermal, quick update, since we last were here, we, of course, would have had confirmation from the Caribbean Development Bank of funding to the tune of some 17 million US dollars, 1 million by way of grant, out and out grant, and 16 million by way of a contingency recoverable grant. And all that means is that when they do the production drilling, if the drilling is successful, then that is converted to a low interest long-term loan. If it is not successful, then the money is a grant. And so this has removed the risk of the drilling phase and we hope to proceed very quickly. The plan is that by June we should have drillers in place and the drilling we anticipate should last for six months, at which point we will issue the RFP for the plant construction. And so we've divided the project into two phases, the drilling phase, which is the risky part of the project, and the second phase, which will be the plant construction. <coughs> If all goes well, as we have promised, we hope to have geothermal energy in Nevis in the very near future. They have sent the agreements for the funding, and those agreements have to be signed off by St. Kitts and by Nevis, the federal government and the NIA, and we have had those agreements since late December. We are now in the process of finalizing them to get them back to the Caribbean Development Bank so that this project can move forward. I have been in discussions with Prime Minister Drew. He's very enthusiastic about this project and we are hopeful that working together, we can deliver geothermal energy, not only for the people of Nevis, but for the entire Federation. Okay, so this was January 26, and we're supposed to start drilling this month. <laughs> Whether you, you realize that in the last press conference, he says uh, they have located two drill rigs and one should be available at the end of the year by January or so. So yeah. we have already moved from start drilling in June of 2023 to perhaps drilling, start drilling in uh, January 2024. So this is, this is par for the course. This is granted his best, you know, this is what he does. You know, uh, I have, it's, to be honest, uh, I have come across some people in my life, whether at university level or to my, you know, private life or public life, I've never met anybody and I swear to God, anybody as incompetent as this man. It's shocking how incompetent he is. It's almost like a disease he has. He can't help it. You know, um, I've never come across it. He does not know how to prioritize. He does not know any sort of strategic planning. He does not know how to tell the truth. You know, everything is a charade. Everything is a sham. Everything is transactional. You know, it, it is just a, a, a pig pan. You know, when that old pig pan, you're throwing all your kitchen waste. It's just a pig pan of nonsense. 
you know, and he's been getting away with it and getting away with it. Thank God, I think from the last results of the last election, people are finally seeing that this pig pan business is not advancing their lives. It's advancing his. It's advancing his because he got full control of the pig pan. All right, but I've never come across anybody this incompetent. It's yeah. shocking. I believe that um, the sun coming down on him, you know, because I am waiting on the Honorable Janice Daniel Hatch to pursue the ombudsman and send the necessary letters where they need to go. Because mm. if nothing else that I have to thank the, the new Labour administration for, and there's a lot I have thanked them for over the years, I mean, over the past couple of months. But the, the main thing I want to thank them for is this good governance agenda and the passing of those bills. Because I think the, um, the AG has laid out the law quite clear for us to understand that monies that belongs to the taxpayers that have been spent must be justified where the money went. Take mm -hmm. a listen. And hopefully, for the folks online who might be questioning my knowledge, this is the AG speaking. This is not DJ Marisha. Um, I also want to take this opportunity, if I can, Prime Minister. I hear a lot of chat um, about procurement. And I think it's important for the people of this country to understand what procurement is. In 2012, there was a Procurement Act passed. Procurement covers three things. Goods purchased with Treasury money. And when I say Treasury money, I mean that's the people's money. Services that are purchased with the people's money, and construction, which is paid for by the people's money. This agreement with East Coast has none of those three elements. It is not a matter of procurement. It is a matter between NHC, which is a statutory corporation, and East Coast, and individual homeowners. There is no government money, no treasury money, that is being paid out for there to be procurement issues. And I find it strange that persons who were in government in the past and should have a great understanding, because I can tell you, the people at this table, we probably hear Procurement Act more than anything else in our offices. I'll give you an example. The, the office wanted, and my PS is here, so she could confirm. The fridge, when I got into the office, the mini fridge was not working. So the office had to procure a mini fridge. In order to procure the mini fridge, the office had to seek to get a quote from TDC, a quote from Hospers, a quote from somewhere else, review, review the quotes, and then choose an option. And the whole point of that process is to ensure that treasury money, the people's money, is being spent in the best way. That is how procurement works. So when, for example, the government wishes to build a training school for the police, the government then, the, the structure under the Procurement Act, sends out tenders and saying, these are the plans for the police training school. We want three, we, sorry, we're sending out a tender for contractors to submit how much it will cost for them to construct this building. When government money is being spent, that's how the process works. So then the tenders come in and the procurement board meets and they determine which contractor they're choosing to go with to build this building. That is how procurement works. So, Brother Daly, the, 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 the wing there at the hospital, is that a private entity or that's government? <laughs> no, it, I tell you that it's not private. It's not private at all, but they're treating, as if, treating, as if, treating it as if it's private. Um, you can't you can get any information. The federal government, I don't know what they're doing with the Freedom of Information Act, but we, we can't seem to get Mr. Brantley to, to um, operationalize that one, the, the bill he passed in Nevis in 2018. And so uh, we are in the dark. We have to rely on their, what they say. We can't petition or write to any ministry on Nevis asking for information as to expenditure or receipts or whatever it is. There's nothing, it's an information vacuum, not even a blackout, vacuum, where they refuse to disclose 
how the people's money is being spent. We have been asking for the longest while for full disclosure about uh, the, all the road projects from, from the Butler's Road to Handy's Road to Bath. We have not gotten anywhere. You know, um, there's no, every time Mr. Brantley is questioned as to why there's a delay in the operation of the, of the Freedom of Information Act, he comes with the same lame excuse that he's, try, he's still trying to identify a person or persons within the relevant ministries to be the conduit, conduits uh, of that, those information. I mean, this thing has been passed since 2017. We are now in 2023. I was a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture. I was a senior technical officer in charge of all finances of the, of the ministry. And so if you were to look at who should be responsible to, to convey information to the public, it would be prominent secretaries or somebody who the prominent secretary charges with, with, with that responsibility. It is not hard, but they're trying to delay releasing information because the information is damning. You have three statutory corporations in Nevis. Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation, Nevlek, and Solid Waste. At no point, and their bylaw speaks to it, that they are supposed to lay before the house every year an audited report. None has been forthcoming under this government since 2013. None, zero. How can you have, how can you have this and say that you're a democratic government, you're a transparent government, you're accountable government? How can those pundits in some cases like to bang them out about how Brandt is a brilliant art politician and he's doing the best for Nevis. Stand by and let this kind of actions or neglect to, to occur and still support him. Are we talking about democracy or are we talking about autocracy? Because clearly what we have in Nevis is autocracy bordering on dictatorship where one man decides what information the public should have um, in order to protect his and his empire here on Nevis. You know, it, it, it is really amazing because, yes, like I said, the, the four deaths in the past couple of days it hit, it hit the Federation bad and we feel it. But those deaths, we all owe a debt. We all going to go. The country going to still be here. But these millions and billions of dollars that is been disappearing and not justification, that is a serious crime as well. You know? I, I want to share something as with you, uh, DJ Maurice, if, if I may. Um, the, the government recently rolled out this retirement package for um, any workers, all right, which I've, I've described it as a sham. It's a scam. And mm -hmm. I mean it. There are two payments that are given to any workers at the end of the year, all right? One is a, is a holiday pay and the other one is another bonus. What they've done with this new, new uh, so-called pension plan is that they have stopped as, in, as of January 1st to pay one of those pay packages that any workers normally look forward to, a couple thousand dollars at the end of the year. They'll stop paying it as January 1st. So across the board, the hundreds of any workers have stopped getting it. They continue to get the holiday pay, but that second larger payment, they've stopped getting it. That money now moves into a fund to pay for the pension of those any workers. There's hardly any new money being put in for the benefit of persons who have given so much of their lives. So you take it away from them in December and you give it back to them some point in the future when they retire, if they are qualified to retire under the government's um, retirement scheme for any workers. It is a sham. It is unfortunate that those, the least among us, and Dr. Joe said it in his press conference, that persons who are being paid less, and he should be ashamed to say something like that, because we all know the any workers 
are the backbones of the public service. Without them, there is no public service to talk about. All those workers in public works, agriculture, in, in all the departments, the bulwark is done by the NE workers. How can in good conscience, Jeffrey, you're gonna have persons making barely minimum wage, having to now, I shouldn't say forced to retire, but when you do a comparison to the established workers, established workers can retire after 10 years with a gratuity and pension. With the NE workers, you, you are required to retire. You can only get a pension with a new scheme after 15 years. After 15 years. You and then the, the funny thing about it, you only become qualified for a pension at the age of 62. 62 when for 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 established workers it is 55 so you have to wait seven years later than your peers to get a retirement package a pension package that from december january 23 they're taking that money out from your from your normal package and giving to you 15 years later why are we treating people like this when you use the terminology NE workers, you mean non-established workers? Non-established workers. Exactly. Okay. Work. I got a receipt, see, a receipt here from last year in during the federal campaign, where the farmer hog said that um his cabinet, uh, his government took care of that and it was let, let me play the clip. Maybe you can clarify this clip for me. We met as a cabinet. I think it was last what do you feel? Wednesday. Wednesday, and we have determined that all the so called non establishment workers they shall become pensionable effective the 15th of May 2012. We've gone back to bring them in. Thousands of workers will have a better day thanks to the Harris led administration. Okay, so. Is, is this the same thing that you're speaking about? The same thing. Um, Nevis has gone a different, basically a different path. I'm not so familiar with what's happening in St. Kitts with that plan. But that plan has no, no real bearing here on Nevis. As a matter of fact, Mr. Brantley said in his last press conference, Nevis has gone on its own and hoping that the federal government plan will um, catch up or they can catch up the federal government plan, whichever one. Clearly they are on different pages. Right? But Brandon and one the same cabinet as he when this thing was rolled out. But the intricacies of it is what is problematic. Right? Um, uh, if you retire before the age of 62, like I said, you don't get any benefits until you get 62. Now, here the problem is that use the same calculation as you would do for the for the for the um established workers. It's similar, it's very similar calculations. All right, very similar. But your gratuity is a fraction, your pension is a, is a fraction of your, 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 your gratuity. In the establish, in establishment, there's nothing like that. So they give you 25% up front for as a gratuity when you retire. And then the 75% is remaining, they pay you over, over a period of time. Stretching out past 15 years is possible. Here the, here's the problem, Jeffrey. The average age or the average mortality age on St. Kitts and Nevis is 71.34 years. 71.34 years. It means that shortly after you retire, if you retire 65, or 62, sorry, you got nine years basically to enjoy your pension before you pass on to the great beyond. That is the average. I'm not saying everybody gonna do that. Once you pass on, that whatever money is left in, in before you get paid out, or you know, be, you know, before you uh, after you die, goes back into the scheme. You don't get it, just like social security. You don't get it. So what the question must be asked: Why are you insisting that the NE workers retire at sixty-two, while the mortality rate, the mortality date, is seventy-one? Why are you pushing some people so close to the retirement, to, to, to the to death's door? 
before they can sit back and enjoy their lives? That's the first question, right? Um, you have to have served 15 continuous years, 15 continuous years to qualify for the pension. And they still turn around and take out your, uh, the, the, the name I was looking for is honorarium, the honorarium and, and the Christmas bonus. Those are the two packages of payments that any workers normally used to enjoy. They have taken out the honorarium completely and give it to you sometime back, sometime to the future. But well, why, anyway. why 15 years though? Well, 15 years, <laughs> if, you, if you speak to actuaries, they're gonna tell you, well, 15 years is a good time to die after you leave the service. No, no, I'm talking about 15 years to be established in the job to get a pension. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know because for, for e-workers, established workers, it's, it's 10 years, right? Um, but 10 years, is, 10 years is still a long time. I mean, I work, I work in, a health, in the health industry here in North America. I put in 20 plus years in a hospital and it's five years, you're, 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 you're um, clear to, to, to get to be pensioned. But, but, but the funny thing is here on St. Kitts and Nevis, the politicians have gone into parliament and given themselves an eight year retirement package. Correct, that's the point I was trying to hear too. <laughs> Eight years, they get almost 75% of their value. So all like the ministers here on Nevis, all of them, except Spencer Brand so far, because he came in in 2017, all right? Um, well, he can get it before he tries, before, yeah, if, he, if everything goes according to his plan. All of them are young people. Troy Leavitt is young. I used to teach Troy Leavitt in school. Um, all of them will get f almost a full pension while they're robbing blind the people who are building brick by brick this country and, and that is and that is me. and that is criminal it bothers me to the highest degree it should not happen 40 years after independence we should not be having this conversation about any and e-workers those are legacies of the british way of discriminated against our local people those mulatto people and white people those were the established class, the establishment. They designed this program to suit them. Our parents and foreparents were the NE class. And we are continuing that legacy, Jeffrey, discriminating against the majority of public servants. Because, you know, it is something we inherited and we have wished to continue. It's nonsense. I want Dr. Jew to go to cabinet. And the same speed at which he um, approved Nevis legal standing, created this bill to, to fix Nevis legal standing in one sitting of parliament. I want him to go to the parliament to do the same thing and eliminate from our, our books this dichotomy between any and e workers. It is an unfortunate legacy that's created more poverty, created more poverty than this country can afford. It is deliberately keeping people poor because under, if you are any workers, you are not entitled to the kind of rights and privileges as an established worker, even though you work twice as hard. This is, this, the, I want Dr. Drew to tell the people, it, my solution is not to say, well, we're gonna examine the gratuity and the pension which he has done and make the corrections which he has done that benefits a few people, which is good for them. But I want him to go to parliament with a piece of legislation to outlaw this nonsense about any and any and e workers. It is high time. And people who continue to vote and vote against their best interests must understand that if they are part of the any, if their families are part of the any, if their mothers and fathers are part of the any, this has to be a topical issue in your house. You cannot continue to support any government that continues to discriminate against you. You cannot remove poverty by impoverishing people. All those homes that want to build in St. Kitts, $111,000. How many of the any workers can go to a bank making $400 a week to afford a house of $111,000? 
What are we? What message are we sending? You know, who I are the soldiers really for? Not cutting you up. I spoke about that a couple of weeks ago, and my experience um, last year. For the first time, I put on um, a red shirt that was give, that was given to me by Miss Vasquez, the DFB. And I walked through the community of, of DFB there with um, Dr. Douglas, um, Senator Clark, and the other folks during the federal campaign. And there's a young man I run into. He's from St. Paul's. His mother is from St. Paul's. And basically, the shop that he was living in, you know how your guys in Nevis make your, your nice little house for your sheep and your goats? <laughs> yes. Well, those houses is a better place than where this gentleman was when he came out to speak to us. And he came and he spoke to me and explained to me what is going on. These guys are guys that are willing to work and trying, but with a son that have some um, issues and stuff, it's hard on him. And I shout out for Dr. Douglas and Mishak and them to come and speak to the gentleman. I said that to say this, that these homes that the prime minister spoke about that is coming and stream, there's people that are going to need those homes, it's gonna be good for them. I have no problem with, with that. I leave that up to Dwyer and them to talk about. The homes I want to see is for the poor man that will not have the opportunity to even get a rabbit cub on their own. So you see this dividends that the prime minister spoke about giving to everybody who pays social security. I would have hoped and pray that that dividend will put to better use for the people that really need it. Not for those millionaires that already have money, right? We, we're talking about fair share. Who's really getting the fair share? There's, okay. peop there's people in Nevis getting a fairer share than Kitty Chance, you know? Agreed. And, Agreed. and the, the, the thing about it is that if we really want to be honest, we need to speak to the people on the ground because I learned some stuff from a domino table. I learned some stuff from guys sitting on the side buying them a drink. And if you listen to some of these stories in the communities, it's really hard. I walked through halfway tree and I walked through um, Godwin Gut. I know the, the minister there, Samuel Duggins, is doing his meetings back and forth. He said he's going house to house. But there are many people who don't have a house of their own. They're on the street, so you would never get to tap them. Mm. Because the houses you're going to, they already have houses. Mm -hmm. Those guys on the sidewalk, that is just, they're cooling out. Um, you don't get to talk to them because they don't have a house for you to go to. And we have a lot of work to do. But, but Jeffrey, the crime. You, 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 stop, you just tapped into some, the nexus. You just, tap, you just tapped into the conversation about the nexus between crime and poverty. Crime and poverty. That is where the nexus is. You cannot have a situation where society has becoming, is becoming more and more unequal. Where you have a prominent class of rich and a growing prominent class of poor. Owning a house or property is the largest investment any one of us will make in our lives. Unless you're a multi-million, you can buy whatever you want. But a house, the, 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 the social benefit of owning a house speaks for itself. Studies after studies have shown that, that children who come from homes where the family owns that home have a higher percentage of, a higher rate of educated, being educated, going to university, becoming business people, becoming productive members of society. These are, these are facts. These are facts. There's a nexus between poverty and crime. If you have an unequal society where you have the well-to-do looking down and the poor-to-do, you can always have conflict. The rich are gonna hold on to what they have and the poor are gonna try to take it. One way or the other, they're gonna either try to take it from the rich or they're gonna try to take it from other poor people. These are the facts. We got some serious problem in our federation, dear partner. And in as much as sometimes I'm not up to 
coming in a Wednesday evening. I will continue this conversation because if we don't, who's going to do it? Listen, I listen to, I've listened to Marsha Henderson. I listened to all the, the political heavyweights speaking about crime and hoping that people would behave themselves. Blah, blah. Who, who are they talking to? Who, who, who is the audience? The audience is not the guy in the street. The audience is me and you and others in the, in the diaspora who want to hear something. But they can't be speaking to the guy in the street. Because if you spoke to the guy in the street, those sorts of comments they make, we're not, we're not carrying no water nowhere. No water nowhere. The it, flowery, you know, oh, perfectly crafted language for us to consume, not the guys who are doing the shooting and the killing and the robbing. Understand that. That demographic there is not listening to that. These guys have made up their minds long time ago that this is the only way out for them for the time being. You know, it, 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 it's funny that you um you brought up that subject because we're looking at the time and I said, well, it's 8.20 and there is three clips that I definitely would like to get in before we, we call it a, a night, which is um Sister Gwyneth Byron. I, I think her comments on um, Freedom some day ago was very eloquent. Um, the Prime Minister's address and also Marsha Henderson. And again, you're correct. These messages is to reach folks in the diaspora who listen to these programs, um, uh, the folks who is on social media, the people that need the, the attention, that needs the conversation, that need the help. They are on the streets, they are on the byways, they are the domino tables, they are the villages, they are the ghettos. Which is where when I in the federation, that's where I hang out. Exactly. This is where this is where I could say the things that I'm saying because I conversate with these people. You cannot pass in your car and wave your hand. We have a bunch of guys in St. Paul's, and they have been on my case from the time the prime minister was elected. Because they do not know the prime minister personally, they have not been able to sit and have a conversation with the prime minister personally. Um, they haven't been able to shake the prime minister hand. And it's not that they want anything. They just want to have that conversation and it will go a long way. And it is not for them to go and make an appointment to sit in his office for a photo app because they need something. It's just they want to feel the presence of their, um, their prime minister. And I have related this to Dr. Joe, and he has agreed to visit um, the folks and whatever. Now it's the same thing that is needed in Nevis. That's what the people in Nevis is asking for. But you will find Baby Brantley and whoever else over there would feel like, well, we are the NIA and the federal government should not be coming inside here to talk to our people or whatever the case. That is nonsense. This is why the federal office needs to be open forth within Nevis. And as the people are requesting, the prime minister need to take the time out and have that town hall in Nevis, however it's done, just like he does in New York or any place where he goes. And I must say in his defense, he have assured me and he have assured the general public via this medium that that is coming in, in the not too distant future. And I look forward to it because they need to feel the people that is more in need not those that already have it. For example, you know, um, I was going to play Gwyneth clip, but before I play Gwyneth clip, let me go back here, because there's a gentleman on social media, I understand over the weekend had me well cuss up, said that <laughs> I beg in money for this program. Partner, I don't beg people for anything. I am good on my own. I can survive on my own. All I said to the people that asked me to um, keep this program going, is to let them know there's a cost to it. There's people that is working with me that I can't afford to pay. I make a contribution. So if you are in a position to make a contribution, do so. That I can give these people a dinner or a lunch because they have families to, you know, and they have me to kill. So this is Sunday gone at the Pam Convention. The millionaire, former minister of tourism, Kentucky franchise, 
they are passing around a basket asking for donation for their party. So for the people that comes online weekly here to listen to the issues, is it wrong for me to say, donate what you can that I can take care of my engineers and my technicians and whatever? It seems like it's a crime to some people. But take a listen to this clip. There is going to be a hat or a basket passing around because the party need money. So if you have $5, put the $5 in. If you have the 20, put the 20 in. If you have 100, put the 100 in. But please, don't let it pass you and nothing goes in it. If you could only put in a dollar, put it in. If you could only put in 25 cents, put it in. Because we take what you have or what you can give. So I want to welcome Daddy Tusek to give us some entertainment. So, my partner, you're part of a, 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 of a podcast uh, and a, on a radio station. I'm pretty sure there's a cost for you guys as well. So, for people to think that these things is not a cost to it and they should not contribute, I don't know where they get this idea from. We just, I mean, we, 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 I, for my program, I rely on, on um, the kindness of strangers uh, to make it happen. Is a political show, so a lot of businesses don't want to be associated with sponsorship, so to speak. They will still pay some money privately to say, you know, to help. But for, my, for example, my program, two hour program, it costs about um, $450 for the two hours uh, every week. You understand? I have to find resources um, through friends and family to, to, to come up with some money. Sometimes the, the station pays, sometimes I have to find the money. But we all try to make it happen because the work we do is so critically important to the public's understanding of what's happening around them that we cannot even take a day off from the research and, and the presentation. Once you see me finish a program on Saturday, I'm already at work doing another preparation for the following week. It takes a lot of time. I'm not being paid for this. The, the same thing on this end, and you know that because we communicate back and forth, you exactly. know. Getting these clips together is not an easy task. Um, put it, putting a show together. As a matter of fact, most people, if not everybody that come on this program, want to know how I'm able to put the songs together with the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a natural thing for me, Mr. Daly. I don't even have to think about it. I sit when down. You, when, you get, when you get criticized, Jeffrey, take it as a badge of honor. Take it as a badge of honor. You don't have to respond to people like that because you know the objective. The objective is to shut you up. When, you start, when people start paying attention to what you're saying and they, they, try, they try to shut you up, tell yourself you're getting traction somewhere and people are uncomfortable. Last year, not to, to, to uh, put any fear into your heart, but the, 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 the murder rate among journalists hit an all-time high. Hit an all-time high. The great state of Israel murdered a journalist. I remember. A journalist. Israel. The Saudis murdered a journalist in Turkey. You have journalists being shot dead across the globe in Africa, in Asia, and America. But what they do, the service they bring to the people. The, the, the work we do put us in direct con conflict with persons who don't want the truth to come out about certain matters. And so take it as a badge of honor when people criticize and say, oh, you're just begging money for your program. Your program is reaching the hearts and minds of a lot of people and is causing heartburn in those who are causing hurt to people. I would say thank you. Stand by. Let's play this first clip. And again, like I said, I want to big up sister um, Gwyneth Byron for her statement there because um, she's a citizen. She's not a minister of government. She's someone that is speaking from her observation. Whether you agree with her or not, it's something to listen to and it's food for thought. So good night, Gwyneth and family. Let's take this next call. Call you on. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Ike. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. What about you? Uh, Ike, I'm very good. I think I want to talk about three matters. Sure. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but you know, when I call, I have a few things to really talk about. Mm -hmm. This is Gwyneth Byron, a.k.a. Gwyneth Badehu Artis, <laughs> speaking. 
One of the things you have to recognize, Eek, and the whole country is that you cannot continue to expect old dogs to teach new tricks. Mm. The government brought back a lot of people who ca- call themselves stalwarts. And I do not know what new they'll be bringing to the table. I'm not seeing it, and I don't think that we'll see it. And we have to call it for what it is. Indeed. Note my words. All dogs have been brought back to teach what new tricks. It will never happen. The camouflage about talking about young people's time. Trust me, that is just a camouflage. And I want to touch on the criminal activity that's going on here in this country. I did a post just a while ago, and I'm going to read it for you quickly. The SKNLP administration and the RSCNPF, that's the police force, cannot continue to portray deafening silence amidst the wanton criminal activity that has already reached number 14. To this end, there should be a serious outburst of disgust raging in the hearts and minds of every kitchen and division who is a mother, father, son, daughter, uncle, aunt, and or any other relation. Where do we seriously go from here? Later this month, we shall be hosting our signature event, dubbed the Sinkis Music Festival. Numerous patrons will be coming to our shows. Will there be a further upsurge slash uptick in criminal activity? Is there an ulterior motive behind these killings? Something is amiss. That's how we ended it, E.K. We cannot continue to go down this path. Are we going to continue to say the criminals are killing themselves? Nothing is coming from Prime Minister Dr. Drew. Nothing is coming from James Sutton. These are the top echelon of our society at this point in time. They're not going to be there forever, but they're in the hot seats right now. It cannot be just to give them a paycheck. Taxpayers' money around the 18, 20 of the month. We cannot continue, EK. I'm going to call it for what it is. I might be the lone voice out there talking. And I don't want any Labour supporters to say she's not Labour because I'm more Labour than Dr. Drew. I am more Labour than Denzel Douglas. I am Bratcher's Labour. And the people out there who know the history of my family with Labour, they know that. People need to stop playing dangerous games. In this country, EK, we cannot continue. We see what's being played out. Truth is something when you try to crush it to the ground, EK, it will always rise again. And it's raising its ugly head every day. EK, you know why I'm successful? I'm a child of God. That's where I could sit down home, because every day, my brain is in the zone. People need to have their brains in the zone. Like me, I don't mean to be funny. It is a winning strategy. I'm not perfect. I'm not more special than anybody else. But EK, we have to have a plan, and a plan to succeed, not a plan to fail. I'm going to come on the radio and, and, and the TV and talk about it. Radio and TV will get a chance to even be on the television. I will talk about it, EK. It is not right what is taking place in this country. It's tantamount to a sin. Don't if you agree with me. I, I, I'm with you. And a lot of people are burying their heads in the sands. This is no laughing matter. I told you already, criminal activity struck my family when I talked about it. It created a stir, even with some family members. I'm going to talk about it. And you know what my answer was to that? I don't care when it comes to the truth. Because people don't like the truth. The truth is not sexy. Right now, everything fake. When it comes to lies, that seems to be their so-called winning strategy. But it is not EK. It's a recipe for disaster, and we see it playing out. Now, you talked a while ago about the service industry. Trust me, what is happening in these government institutions, and to a certain extent, some of the business places, just craziness. Lack of service, I mean, it's just awful. We're talking about the young people, they're not being trained. EK grew up in an institution where training was a big thing. Every day you got to work, you felt like if you don't perform, you're going to lose your job. Mm-hmm. I was there for umpteen years, and every day I felt like I had to perform to maximum capacity to make the bosses happy, and at the end of the day, it rubbed off well on me. I blogged when the government changed, you know, I did a blog that said we need a performance review system in St. Kitts, where people's performances would be assessed, whether quarterly, semi-annually, or annually. Because once you keep people on the toes, EK, they will have to perform, otherwise you'll put them to the door. 
revamp the system, come in your policies, but it seems as though our government ministers don't have the wherewithal to engineer these things because it starts from the top, you know. It starts from the top, EK, and you would have had to set the ground running. You cannot go in there and say you've been in there only eight months, nine months, we're into month 10. And if you didn't set it running from the beginning, expect to change it after year one, year two. It doesn't work like that. Not with the general public. The general public like people to allow them to run wild. And right now that is happening. It is quite clear. Nothing has changed. It's just the players, really. But in terms of the actual game, the game is the same. And I can tell you, EK, when it comes to the passage of time, people will adjust their minds. And all who are out there saying that Dr. Harris this and Dr. Harris that, you will be surprised to know that same Dr. Harris could become Prime Minister again of this country. Let us stop pretending. You will be surprised to know Sean Richards could be a Minister of Government, if not a Prime Minister of this country, down the road. Let us not sit down here and play naive and say, Pam is dead, and Unity is dead, and, and PLP is dead. That's not true, EK. They're very much alive. It's people we are dealing with. And you know, as I blogged already and said, we have a lot of people in the river on the bank. And these are the dangerous people you have to be very mindful of because they're laughing and talking with you on a daily basis. They're not coming direct like me. Eka, I have nowhere to go, you know. I'm labeled to the bone. I make no bones about it. You said on the radio, I'm labeled to the bone. Every election, I will vote for the Labour Party. I believe in the principle and the ideology of the Labour Party, but the present set of ministers, they really have to step up to the plate and do better. Because right now, I don't think I can give them a passing grade. And I'm being very frank. People have a way of saying, EK, criticize privately, applaud openly. I don't believe in that. Because what we see happening to with some people, they want to get accolades for work not done. It's not right. People should be praised for work done and seen to be done. We have a problem. Let us stop pretending we do have a problem, EK. I and we okay. can't continue. No, the 10th of June is fast approaching. I told you already how strong labor I am, eh? I read a few posts where people still trying to deny the 10th of June. Okay. So that is um, Gwyneth's position there and freedom. And Dr. Daly, in as much as I would say, a return of the farmer hug as prime minister is over my dead body. In as much as I will say that, right? When it is making some sense there, you know, if this government don't pay attention and allow their supporters, because look at this, you know, nobody gonna tell me and nobody's going to tell God that the work that DJ Marisha did over the past two plus years and this, with this program did not help bring down the farm administration or help put the Labour Party into office. But some of these same Labour people who thought I was doing a great job, because now we call it a spade a spade, they have me to kill. But when you have a commentary like that coming from a citizen, speaking from the heart, why wouldn't I play it? Why shouldn't I play it? Here's, here's the conundrum, as I see it. I listen to her intently, and her position is part of the problem. She says she's labor to the bone, right? and she would always vote labor. Correct. But isn't that part of the problem? Correct. That's what I said to you. We have to play these clips that people could hear for themselves. Because the people are out there telling me, you know, that it's, baby it's, Brantley is baby Brantley's all bad, no good for Davis. But they will not vote for nobody else but CCM. But that's that's it, that's the thing that struck struck me as being so hypocritical because the, the government serves at the behest of the people. All right, they serve they serve at the at the at the convenience of the people. And if people are getting bad governance, why would you want to return the same government to power? And then expect a different result. I mean, that's the, that's the definition of insanity. It's crazy. The you thing know? about it is if government are continuous, if the people you put into office for whatever reason are not doing what they're supposed to do, then when you get the opportunity, you remove them. 
Dr. Daly, I know you guys position in Navis. I know how you guys feel about the, 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 the bed business with the Labour Party and, and, and Baby Bantler. I understand all of that. I will not tell you all I know how you feel, and I would not try to change your attitude from it. But what I can say is this, right? The Prime Minister and his cabinet appoint a new commissioner of police. There is a new deputy of commissioner of police, and the work has to be done. Do you like mangoes? Mm -hmm. You like mango? Of course. You have a you have a plant of mango seed or mango tree? Of course. How long it take you to get mango from that tree? Fifteen years. Fifteen years. So you had an administration that was there with baby Brantley for seven years that's done a lot of damage. Put a, a lot of things that is happening now is what was planted that is now coming to life. Is what we are bearing. The fruits has been bearing now. How can it be fair? No matter your political divide, how can it be fair for anyone in their good conscience to blame a government who has been there for 10 months with everything that they made that they are trying to repair, blaming them for what is happening to them? <laughs> it's, it's, it's unconscionable to do that. Really, you know, um, persons who don't understand how government actually works may make those conclusions, but being in government for from since 2000 and since 1998, uh, working with different governments, different ministries, I know how these things work. It takes a long time for things to get done, and and therefore when you when you when you're incoming, once you pass that short honeymoon period, everything is now your fault, and the opposition will make it appear that all the things they did uh, uh, were good, and everything that's happening now is bad. It's politics. What Dr. Drew and his cabinet need to understand that you cannot be reactionary. You have to be proactive. All right. What I when I listened to his speech last evening um, about you know the crime situation, uh, I didn't. I, I'm too honest with you. I didn't get much out of it. So I have to be honest, I didn't get much out of it. And I think that was a general consensus. There was no there there. I think um, I don't know how did I made it better. Um, but there was no gravitas to it. There was no weight to it, as people as people say on the road. There was okay. nothing there. Okay, well, let's, let, let's take a listen together and, and see how the folks online feel about it. Because, like I said, I, I look at the broadcast and I see the pain in the prime minister. In, in, you, you could see the veins in his face. I do not know what people would expect different or better. But I would suggest that if there are ideas that other folks have in how to deal with this matter, to just make the suggestions because the Prime Minister simply says that um, the plans that have been put in place, the um, High Command will be having their meeting today. I don't know if they had it, I didn't get a chance to listen to it. But just listen to the Prime Minister's address. Fellow citizens and residents, our Federation has been shaken by the recent upsurge in gun violence from reports, the majority of which are linked to gang-related crimes highly concentrated in the community of Central Bastia. As Prime Minister and Minister of National Security, I express my sincere regrets and deepest condolences to the families of those who have succumbed to violent crimes and who are in bereavement 
at this time. I also share the concerns of our communities and the nation as a whole. Each life is precious. Every endeavor should be made to preserve life and maintain the safety of our people. Crime reduction requires the input and efforts of all of us. I therefore appeal to the general public to cooperate with the security forces. Immediately, the security forces will implement the following. 1. Increased security presence in our communities through various methods. 2. Further engagement of regional and international security experts to work along with our forces. 3. Strengthening of the intelligence capabilities of the security forces. 4. Expansion of the CCTV infrastructure island-wide. And 5. Enhancement of evidence-gathering capabilities to ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. The High Command of the Police Force will hold a press conference tomorrow to give more detail on these initiatives to the general public. The Cabinet has also agreed to table legislation in the National Assembly to increase the penalty for illegal firearms offences from 15 to 25 years in prison. I reassure you that our security forces will be unrelenting in working collaboratively in the obligation to preserve law and order in our Federation. Our streets must remain safe so that the law-abiding citizens and residents of our Federation can enjoy their peace and tranquility. Your government believes in providing a second chance to our citizens and residents who have fallen afoul of the law. However, it cannot be a second opportunity to repeat criminal activity. The present upsurge in criminal activity is a natural and direct result of the monetization of crime management. Similar methods were tried and failed in Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Mexico, Haiti, and El Salvador. In every occasion, it resulted in what we are seeing right now in our federation. Contrary to the propaganda peddled in social media by irresponsible naysayers, the Labour Party administration did not stop the peace program. However, your government on taking office began and continues to be committed to the reformation of the program with rehabilitation at its core. I therefore appeal to the young men and women to move forward as law-abiding citizens with respect for the rights and livelihoods of others. I have commissioned the National Task Force to take the lead on a behavior-changing initiative, crime and violence as a public health issue. This is a more scientific, sustainable and holistic approach to crime fighting, which includes dealing with the issue of violence from a public health perspective. This is a multi-pronged approach built on several pillars that draw on the knowledge and expertise of stakeholders for multiple disciplines to implement a plan of action designed to sustain a culture of non-violence throughout the Federation. Our country wraps our arms around all the families who have lost loved ones to gun violence, whether recent or in the distant past. But our thoughts and prayers are not enough. They are not enough to erase the grief. They are not enough to subdue the anger. They are not enough to prevent such acts from happening again. We have to work together at all levels of governance, as well as throughout all communities and households, to do more to stop the destruction of human lives in our beautiful twin island nation, and we will succeed together. Once again, I urge all of us to bring about the positive change we want to see in our country. May God bless the memories of those who recently lost their lives. May God give comfort to their families and their, as they navigate this trying time. And may God bless our beloved Federation of Sinkets and Nevis and keep us safe. So, um, Brother David, tap your screen, open your mic there. Um, the Prime Minister gave his address. I think it was um, straight to the point and whatever. Um, you say you did not feel the bias. What do you think could have been added there to make a difference in his delivery? Well, number one, it was part of the speech was contradictory because he said the government, the governments across the world who have tried 
this monetization of crime has all, have all failed. And in the next breath, he says that the government will continue the C program. I mean, I, I can't make sense of that. You know, you, you're either gonna have the program or you're not gonna have the program. The uncertainty is just as bad as, as anything else. And that is one of the faults of, of, the, of, the, of the program, one of the conversation about the program. The monetization of the program, he said clearly, has caused problems across the world. And the government has reformed some of it, but they intend to continue with this monetization of, 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 uh, of crime. Uh, that to me is neither, that's, I mean, why can't I make sense of that? That's the first thing. The second thing, of course, he is a comforter in chief. He did an excellent job of comforting families who have lost their loved ones. I mean, that is expected from the head of state, the comfort and bring relief to families, right? He spoke about, you know, bringing in expertise from across the world or region to help create a plan of action. But Jeffrey, come on, the issue of crime and violence is nothing new to the Federation of Sinkies and Navies. If you're now talking about bringing in these regional experts to guide um, the process, we all knew and all we all know that crime is just below, especially violent crime, is just below the surface. They have a database of persons who are part and parcel of the peace program. They know who everybody, everybody is. They know who we everything is. Assuming that the people who are committed these crimes up were part of this program. I, and I don't know. They have not said it. What, does anybody know whether the, the 16, 18 persons who have died were part of the program? I don't know. You know, I would, I would, I would expect that kind of information to be in forthcoming. They say, yes, we had six of them who are part of the program and we are looking into why the, this part of the program fell apart. The second thing, the third thing I don't like, I didn't like about it is the presentation is the fact that, you know, um, hard, the hard issues were not really tackled. I mean, you talk about bringing in CCTV systems, you're talking about more police surveillance, especially the hotspots in McKnight and other areas in, 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 in um, Center Bass there, up in Monkey Hill, Stapleton, wherever the murders are occurring, all right? This should have been an ongoing exercise, not a reaction to a situation that's unfolding now. If there was a presence, heavy presence, as now is prescribed, why wasn't there a heavy presence from day one of the mur first murder in December of last year? I mean, it seems that the people are reacting to situations. So what happens now if there's a lull of three, four months before another murder happens? All those pat patrols stop and then they start back. It does, we need a consistency that I'm not hearing. We need a, 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 a systematic approach that I'm not hearing, all right? We need a proactive approach, which we're not hearing. You heard from the police today to say that due to no fault of their own, their CCTV system is often down. They can't help that. And he, he cited very good reasons why. I can't fault him for that. But is the technology that they're using up to speed. I'm talking about facial recognition technology, um, not just surveillance. I'm talking about kind of technology that can read a license plate or pick up a guy's features on a bike and have that on a database for uh, on a file somewhere that co-op, that the, the police who are looking at this can say, listen, this guy is up to no good. Do we have the kind of insider information where you have uh, people are being paid on the payroll for, for information? you know, um, regular infiltration of these gangs where persons are reporting. Do we have that as part of the program? I mean, how do you solve crime when you don't know who is perpetrating it? I mean, if you're gonna bring in FBI and CIA and all kind of people, Mossad and all kind of things people suggested, there are no murderers in, 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 in Israel, America, um, in Canada. There are no murderers up in those places that are unsolved. How come they can come down here and solve murders and they can't solve their own? We have to rely not so much 
on the end result. No, we have to go back to the basic, like I said before. You cannot stop crime when you have an equal an unequal society and on an, a growing unequalness in society. You cannot stop crime when you have a, a growing uh, middle class and upper end class and a growing uh, base of poor people. There must be consequences for this disparity. We are seeing it. If you put rats in a barrel, they're going to fight among themselves to see who get the last piece of cheese. It's only natural. And I'm not, I'm not saying people are rats, but the, 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 the equivalent is that you are putting people in condensed areas to live. McKnight, um, Irish Town, Newtown, um, Stapleton, festoon with crime and violence and expect them to survive. Is one for it, it is either I survive or I or you ain't gonna survive. You hit me, I hit you back. There's no confidence in the police, obviously, for persons to run and tell them what's going on. You have to examine that. Why is there no confidence? in the security forces that people don't feel they can go honestly speak to an officer without their name being broadcast across the world. These are issues that you can get from the people on the ground by speaking to people on the ground and the domino tables in the bar shops. Why is it so few people are coming forward to tell the police? Because people know, people know what's going on. Why do they feel they can't speak? Why is it that they're afraid of? What is it they're afraid of? Is there a witness protection program? Is there security for families? What is it that preventing people from being um, judicious citizens and report on matters? Why do they have no confidence? Why is that so many people, the more you kill, the more a new one comes up, take their place knowing fully well, they're gonna die soon enough too. Why is it that, what, what has culture, that mentality that, hey, to hell with it, I'm gonna take with what I can. These are the kind of questions that I want to hear from a prime minister, that we're gonna examine the root causes of, of these problems. We're gonna go into these areas here, see how we can address what issues are on the ground, speak to the people on the ground. I expected the prime minister to come and say, listen, I went into Mac Knight, I went into Stapleton, I went into Monkey Hill, right? I went to the Dorset. And from what I'm hearing from the young people, I can report to you that these are the steps we believe and help to alleviate or stem the, the, this, this upsurge in crime. What are the issues facing them? Not what you think the issues are. What are they telling you are the issues? Not what you feel the issues are. And this is the problem I have, this disconnect between the politicians and the political directorate and the man on the street who are committing these crimes who know people who are committing these crimes. When I want to find out about a situation in Anibis, I don't call my friends in the police force. I call my friends on the street. And the, the information is 99% accurate. 99% accurate. So why is it that we are not using these resources? Second thing, quickly, you have a database of all the supervisors of the Pay for Peace program. You know what the big wigs are in these syndicates. You're paying them, they're on the payroll. Is any pressure being put on them to stem the, 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 these crimes, to, to hold back their soldiers or whatever they call themselves? Has any pressure, financial pressure being put on them to say, listen, you are part of this program, we expect you to perform a certain process, a pro, uh, function, not just to be with the paymaster and who decides who comes onto the program or doesn't. We expect you to hold a piece in exchange for this monetary, money, money, money the rising of the, prog of the program. But Dr. Ju also needs to come very clear, DJ, as to the future of this program. Right now, it's too obtuse, too, too, um, un there's too many un more unknown, too many moving parts. He needs to say, what will be the fate of this program? There's too much uncertainty and the political uh, opposition, Dr. Harris and Sean Richards, uh, from their positions, are saying it's a direct result of the uncertainty of the Pepper Peace program that's propelling this violence. How did the Prime Minister answer that? He did not answer it. 
he made the matter worse in my estimation by having these two positions that he clearly said in his press conference. Finish? Yeah. Okay, for starters, um, you said a mouthful there and a lot of what you're saying, I would hope that at some point in time that the ministers of government, the AG and the prime minister get a chance to look at this program and take whatever they're hearing and see what they can do with it. But there's um, a couple of things I would like to just comment on that you spoke about, just to shed some light. Um, the, the life or the status or the future of the pay for peace or the lifestyle um, change program, whatever they want to call it, that is on the revamp. I don't think that the prime minister have that answer in 10 months. He just installed a, a new commissioner of police, what, two months ago, three months ago, mm -hmm. and a new deputy. So in fairness to the, to the, to the forces and in fairness to the prime minister and his team, I don't think that they can come to the general public with such an answer. That, me, that problem me, needs a lot more diagnostic. Um, let, me, let me stop you there for a moment, if I may. Mm. They might have been in government since August 5th, but they have been in opposition since 2015. They would have had more than enough time to formulate their position as to whether this program, which I started, I think it began in like 2017 or 2018, thereabouts. They, they would have had enough time to have looked at the information, looked at the, 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 the effects across the world of programs like this, and come to a conclusion whether this is something they want to continue, yes or no. If it's yes, then how can we make it better? How can we craft it in a way that we take, we extract ourselves from the process as politicians, as law enforcement, and make it work? In El Salvador, or uh, El Salvador, I think it was Costa Rica, one of those countries that have it. The program was not orchestrated through the government or the government ministries. The, the, the resources came through NGO. So the government was still free and capable of going after wholeheartedly, full throttle against gangs, right? This in this situation in St. Kitts and Nevis, it's very dangerous because you have law enforcement being a part and parcel of a pay for peace program. It compromises, it must compromise because it's a conflict. You are supervising persons who you know will be committing crime, paying them not to commit crime, but yet you're in charge of law enforcement. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. I, I, want, I, want, I want to respond to you, but before I respond to you, I want to ask you a question. Mm. Do, you, do you think such a program, as we call it, the Pay for Peace, is sustainable? No, it's okay. not. All right. It's and I want to believe that the Labour administration or the Labour cabinet feel the same. Now, elections, the federal elections was in 2020. Correct? Yes. At what point did you personally think that we would have gone back into a federal election? I didn't anticipate a federal election um, until 2025, actually. Okay. So, right. so to that point that I'm trying to, um, to understand that, I know that even when I was on my campaign trail and reaching out to the labor stalwarts or the labor supporters for support, um with my um demonstrations and whatever they said they were drinking the water and waiting till 2025 you know they were minding their business mm -hmm. right so what is going on today and what has the, the the administration has done thus far there are certain things i can mark them on and mark them very hard but this particular situation here it's a ticklish one um i cannot in good conscience, blame I, the current administration for the, where we are because the people that created the situation is right there in Nevis. Baby Brantley was a part of the con concussion with yeah. Pam, Sean Richards and Timothy Harris. Those I who agree. are pointing the fingers now is them plant this, this seed. I, I agree 100%. So but, we, but here, we, it we, here it is. 
is when you, when you have entitlement programs involving money and the dispensation of money, especially across a wide sector of society, it is never an easy thing to pull it back because people become dependent on that money, for whatever reason, good or bad. And we are seeing the fallout from the reformation of the poverty alleviation program, the PAP. We are seeing, we are seeing fallout from the reformation of the STEP. Anytime there's an entitlement, people feel that their money is theirs until perpetuity. And any attempt to reform it, to even make it better, people will resist. That is human nature. But is that even about making it better, you know, Mr. Daly? I think in some of your broadcasts, I heard you refer to the fact that you in the, were in the education system, um, teacher or whatever. Yes. You know, one of the hardest things for us Black people throughout my um, travels around the world, we are very hard, very difficult to accept new things, even though it's better for us. Mm -hmm. They just want to stick with the old way of doing things, you know. True. I remember I had a gentleman from Dominica. He's older than me. But the fact that he's older than me, he don't think I should be telling him what to do. Though I'm his supervisor. <laughs> and we had some backup generators. I don't know if you remember some years back, New York had a big blackout yes. for, from the east to down, down to south, right? Mm -hmm. And over the years, I was preaching to my supervisors about making sure we have proper storage tank for the nursing home. And they didn't think we we're going to have this problem. So they put a little small tank there in the generator and think that was OK. Now, the gentleman was doing something in the generator room. And I went and I saw him. I asked him, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? I said, the question I asked is, what are you doing? He didn't respond to me. I said to him, this is the way you do this. He looked at me. He said, how old are you? I told him. He said, well, I've been doing this before you was born. <laughs> I said, guess what? You've been doing it wrong all along. <laughs> right? You've been doing it wrong all along. This is the I way did. it's done. Right? And he hold me up in his crap for some time. Now go fast forward to this blackout. During the blackout, over in my, my area, we have three generators and I have two electricians and myself because the other guys was at the other area. And I put him in, a, in the room to monitor the same generator he was doing in nonsense with, you know, because what I had to do with some, pe with some of the guys from housekeeping, is actually taking five gallon buckets of diesel from the main tank across the street to fill up the tank on the other side in the nursing home to keep that going. So while I'm out there busy doing that, when I came back around, I look up at the tall building and I see the lights giving me a flashing, giving me a flashing. And by the time I get inside, the place gone dark. Generator shut down. And when I go inside and I talk to him, it's the same exact thing I spoke to him about weeks ago, is what he did not do. And the pump for the fuel, to pump the, the, the fuel into the, 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 the tank for, the, for that particular generator, stop. And we are now calling the elevator company and the generator company and everybody to come in. And because of the blackout, you couldn't get anyone. I do not know if you ever do work on a diesel engine, one of the hardest engine to get restart when it, when it shut down is a diesel generator because mm. the airlock, yeah. you, have, you have to clear that air. And luckily I had the skills and the knowledge to get into that system and clear out the air and get the generator back online and, and repair the tank and get it up and going. And everybody loved me that night because, you know, lights come back, everybody happy. And at the end of the day, 
You think once everything resolved, everybody was happy after that? They gone back to the same old thing <laughs> that I spoke to them about. Make sure that you do this because you never know what's going to happen. We got a problem where we wait until there's a problem. We react to the problem, and once the problem is gone, we, we go back to normal. And that is what you were just speaking about in terms of the forces. I would want to believe, if nothing else, um, the prime minister and his new cabinet will ensure that, as he said in his um, broadcast, there's a presence of forces within the communities. And that will have to be there for some time. It cannot be a one month fix or a two month fix or any short thing. They have to make sure. You know, when I was walking the street of Sinkis by myself, trying to bring attention to what was happening with the farm administration, I was walking by myself. And without exaggerating, I think it was at least 20 to 25 police vehicles circled me where I walk. Wherever I walk, they circling me. I didn't have any guns. I was just walking on social media talking to my people, letting them know what happened in the Federation. If you go to these events, you see these trucks and bus and car with these folks driving around on them. They need to walk in the communities. Exactly. They need to go back to what it used to be. I can't tell you last time I saw foot patrol in Nevis. I'll be honest with you. I can't tell you last time, except there's an officer that comes around with a ticket and give people tickets for illegally parking. I can't tell you last time I saw foot patrol in Nevis, especially in the evening. Um, you, it doesn't happen. You don't see it. I don't know if they had enough manpower or what the situation is, but there's no physical presence. Growing up, everybody was on foot. Charlestown isn't a big place, but you always bump into an officer. Anytime after five, they're on the road, patrolling through the, the back roads and back streets, making sure nobody breaks down by the properties and stuff like that. We never had these issues. There's a physical presence, you understand? And I don't know what prevents us from doing that or going back to that, but certainly that is one of the, the things that need to be re revisited. I hope the police high command will have it on their things to do, to have that physical, and that just because it's a flare up, people want to build a relationship with the police. There was a police, there were police officers at Nevis who I knew by their first names. As a small boy, they used to play cricket with us. They used to come to the back, they used to play cricket in the back of the, the public library in Charlestown. You know, we know other officers like Spooners and they used to come. And, and have talks with us walking through the neighborhood. You understand? You, in order for persons to, to understand the role of police, the police have to be visible. The police need to be accountable. You understand? And we're not seeing that. We are seeing them cruising by in the cruisers, glass up. You know, we see them giving tickets, you know, all kind of things. But that community policing, just like you have community nursing, and community health care and community public works. You need community policing to be back on the agenda. So people feel not only confident that they can speak to officer, but the police, that you can have confidence that the police have the best interests at all. Yeah, thanks for your contribution on that, um, Brother Daly. Now, as I said earlier, the, the, the upsurge in this crime, I love to give things a chance to work, right? It doesn't matter which party in power, you got to give things a chance to work. The prime minister came out yesterday and he made his remarks. Now, I personally, we're gonna give it some time to work because I understand what he was trying to, to pursue. And even after listening to the prime minister, I had the opportunity to listen to, to Marsha Henderson. And for a new parliamentarian, I'll be honest with you, I was impressed with her maturity into the role. And for me, I was impressed with her speech and I'm hoping that the fact that they're saying something, which you means- impressed. Which you means, are impressed. You are impressed. Correct, I, I am giving you my opinion. The, yeah, fact yeah. That, the fact that they are saying something yeah. tells me that they know what is happening, they see what's going on, and we are going to hold a foot to the fire. So before you give your input on it, let's the online viewers who might not have heard her presentation, hear it and um, 
you you're welcome to give your input because guess what i could be missing some things that you might bring out and as usual i know you bring out some stuff bad now i um you're very um a very good educator so i have no problem with you highlighting um the shortcomings but let's take a listen to miss henderson my beloved constituents of Macnights and Central Bastille, like you, I am extremely outraged and profoundly disturbed at the recent uptick in crime and tragic acts of violence against our people, particularly those from and in the Macnight and surrounding areas. Reports of every new loss weighs heavily on all our hats. Crime is not one problem. In fact, it is many difficult problems linked to one another, the solutions to which therefore must be linked in a strategic and unified approach. There is some evidence to suggest that many of the murders we have seen in the recent weeks were related to gang activities and retaliation. The fact that violence is gang related does not and should not by any means reduce our grief those lost to violence belonged to all of us. Today, I want to talk about some of the immediate steps that are being taken to reduce the proliferation of illegal weapons on our streets in the central Bastyr communities and to disrupt the violence. Our communities in McKnight and central Bastyr need more manpower and more resources. I continue in this regard to advocate on the cabinet level for the good people of Central Bastyr. I have advocated for the increase of police presence in hotspots with saturation patrols for as long as they are necessary so as to ensure that our people are safe in their homes and on the streets. I have heard the cries of the mothers, sisters, brothers, fathers, and neighbors who continue to reach out and I share in your pain and grief. I have the full support of the cabinet and we have agreed to increase access to mental health services and mental health education through our public health system and community-based initiatives. Specifically, a special team is being put in place to assist our grieving families and community members with the psychological support that is needed to get us through these tragic and unfortunate events. In recent weeks, we have done some work at the Irish Town Primary School and have increased patrols at the temporary school sites so that our schools are safer for all our children, teachers, and staff. In the upcoming weeks, I intend to engage with the recently commissioned National Security Task, Task Force to discuss how our communities can benefit from this initiative. I welcome any suggestions, comments, or observations that are deemed to be necessary and of course relevant as we continue to work together for the good of the people of McKnight and Central Bastion. Let me just say before I close that one of the final things that need to happen in our nation and in our communities is that we must take crime and violence out of the competitive political space and place it as a national priority. McKnighters and all of us in Central Bastyr deserve safer streets, safer schools and communities. We all have a role to play. For those of you who despair but believe the problem is someone else's to be solved, I urge you to get involved. Volunteer in your neighborhood. Look out for each other's children, pray together, and then outside of the church's walls, work together to help those who are in crisis. The past few weeks have been difficult, but we can all work together to lift each other and to lift our beloved Mac Knight and our central Bastyr. I remain committed to serving and working for you. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay, so Brother Daly, I'm going to say first, firstly, he should not have taken 16 murders, or he should not have taken four murders in two days, or uh, in 24 hours for these speeches to come ahead. 
by the prime minister and by Ms. Henderson, right? It should have been done from day one, but is what we have that we are working with. What gives me comfort is that they have come forward. I have not heard the press conference from the high command. I'm going to go and check. And whatever is said there, I will update my position and whatever on the next program. But at the end of the day, we know that is not everybody being looked at with the same level of respect. The amount of outrage I heard yesterday when this young man, OJ, was shot or got killed. I don't think I heard as much outrage for the other 15. I don't know <laughs> about you and Nevis. <laughs> but sometimes is when it come on your doorstep or on your kitchen table is when you're going to react. Mm. Because this gentleman, I don't know him personally, is after a lot of back and forth people WhatsApp with me and, and telling me what's going on. It appears as though if it's the same gentleman that had a food truck right on the corner of Central and Fourth Street when you're going across towards BCA. Mm. I'll be honest with you, I see the guy there serving food stuff all the time. I never even look in his face, but I always say hello and he always say hello back. But we have never had any contact. But speaking to most people, it seems as though that he was well known. And if it took that gentleman's death yesterday to bring this outrage, then at least something trigger some action. Because as everybody has been saying, Dwyer have said it. I think some have said it previously when we have conversation. One death is one death too many. We are now up to 16. Some said 23 since the Labour administration took over. But again, what are the root cause? What is happening at our borders? Where these guns are coming from? We don't manufacture guns in St. Kitts Nevis. So, right. partner, you know, that's just the way it is. Eh? Go ahead and um, give your input on that. I, I, I think she hit on all the buttons that need to be pressed on her presentation. We all know that speeches like these are expected from politicians when a crisis like these. I think the fact that there were multiple murders um, occurring along with the OJ's brother prompted a lot of the conversation that we're now having. Um, clearly what you said is, was indeed true, is, is indeed true that the prior murders before OJ and the double murder, um, they on, I think it was on Keon Street or somewhere there, um, prompted outrage. But the 14 should have prompted outrage. The 15 should have prompted outrage. The one should have prompted outrage. I don't understand how we manufacture this outrage selectively uh, based on who it is who got killed. I mean, if it was one tourist who got killed in Frigate Bay by gun violence, we would have had, you know, outrage can done. If it was a, a family member of a, of a politician, we'd have had outrage can done. But these people who are killing each other have been deemed um, to be less than, and therefore the outrage becomes selective. We have to face that, that's a fact. We have become so numb to these murders, these tit for tat murders, we have put them in the outer order bundle and said, listen, they didn't kill one another. It's only when good standing citizens like OJ get killed, we have a conversation or the, the, the spacing between murders become problematic. You know, um, they've been trickling, one, 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 one. And, you know, there's no outrage. There's a condolences, there are condolences, and we move on to the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, right? So you have to ask yourself then, why is it only when you have situations like what we have now, that you have this coming out of all these political parties, every single one have come out to register their, their outrage. Eh? So all those 14 or 15 who died before OJ and the double murder that they had, they don't, have, they don't have parents. They don't have, they don't have family and friends who felt it. 
we, we need to stop this nonsense. It's, it's hypocritical and people are seeing it. I read a, I read a comment to, somebody sent to me today and the question was basically, who the F Martha, Marsha thinks she's talking to? It can't be us down here in McKnight. It can't be us. I don't know how many people saw it, but they feel that like she's not talking for them. And that is a serious matter. When your message is going over the heads of the same people who you say you're speaking for. I mean, that is serious. No, I, I don't have any data to, say how many, to know how many people feel that way. But if one person feels that way, tell yourself that person is having a conversation with other persons who feel the same way. The issue in areas like McKnight and other areas that are depressed, they're depressed because of economics. People don't have no jobs. People don't have no work. People can't pay their bills. They can't live comfortable. Those are the things that need to be solved. Jobs, jobs and jobs. Those they, they need to be fixed, whether it's McKnight or Frigate Bay. People need work. Through work and getting an honest paycheck, people feel important. They feel empowered. But you can't be preaching to them about, you know, um, holding hands and singing Kumbaya when you're starving to death. You can't, you can't live comfortably. You don't have a house to call a home. Come on, we, we, are, we, are, we are not being serious. Uh, we are putting band-aids over gaping holes uh, in people's lives. And until we start addressing the fundamental, fundamental reasons as to why you have crime, why you have such violence, you know, where people feel that it's the only way out until you start addressing those. And I, I, forgive, forgive me, but I like the idea, and we spoke about it briefly before you played the tape, about having a, a, a greater police presence. That's the enforcement side. I have no difficulty with that. We all know it's important to have the physical presence of peace officers. And I welcome that suggestion. But are you going to move patrols away from Diet Bay? Saddlers away from, um, uh, say, Old Road, and put them into uh, and put them into um, into the hotspots. Is that is I, that the way? Is I, that the way to go? I, I would recommend police. Um, a police officer work is different to the soldiers. Eh? I do not know. Um, if the specific how it's done. But I would believe that in addition to the police in the respective areas, the soldiers need to be present, have to have a presence as well. And um, many of the police stations in the rural areas, like in St. Paul, St. Paul don't have a police station for some time now. And the police station that was built in the Bay, I understand since um, last year, even before the elections, uh, there was some mole problem there. So there's no police station operating in, in Deep Bay. So they are now sharing a room in Tamanekel and they're over there based on the complaints I have received from the police. They have been treated like simple shit over there. And um, they are asking for assistance in this regard because so you have a moral are, problem. You got a it's, moral a, problem. it's a serious moral problem amongst the police force, a serious, serious moral problem. And that's the point I was trying to make, is that a lot of these things I'm speaking about on this program, they go from back under the previous administration that this administration inherits, and they're not going to fix overnight. I do not know if you, I know you spoke about it, you and Brother Tulu and um, Carlisle, about the police station in Nevis, that um, the prime minister said that um, that is the responsibility of the federal government and they are moving in doing whatever they are. There's so much problem that these folks inherit, um, Brother Daly. And anyone got to be unconscionable to expect all of these problems to fix within 10 months. And that's, that's all I'm simply trying to say. Well, and I, I, I don't expect it. Yeah. Um, I think it'll be foolhardy for persons to expect it. Um, but sometimes the delays um, in executing these matters is what people are judging by. 
Yeah, but uh, which, which one takes precedence? I mean, you and I out in the general public, a lot of us in the general public, and we have an opinion, but we elect these folks as experts to take care of the, the most important things. So um, who are we to sit out there? I'm gonna give you a little example. I had a situation some years back. The winter here in New York is very brutal. There's a property that has three floors, three levels. The windows need to be replaced, but the landlord don't have the money to change all the windows at one time. So they brought in the experts to find out what is the best move, which windows to, to, to change first. And it turned out that the windows that the landlord was um, in the apartment the landlord will live in were the worst windows because there was single, um, single glass. So that was more dangerous to the folks. The others were double glaze. So they could have gone a little longer. So naturally the landlord started changing out the windows where they have the single glass. And some of the tenants had a problem why would the landlord be changing out their windows and not the other tenants' windows? But you assess a situation and you take time to do it step by step when you don't have the resources to do everything. As much as you prioritize, I understand that. Yeah, you know, in as much as the, I, we hear them talk about how much million dollars came in from the CBI and whatever, whatever. I understand 500 of it went across to Navis. I heard the prime minister said when he got into office, they got into the red. The country was in a mess and the international scene, we have, they had to reestablish um, status with the outside. I understand they now have um, some understanding with some, the, the visa situation in Canada. All these are things that had to be worked on. It is not a, a single road. They had to do different things simultaneously. As a result of that, there's some problem at home, but... But let me ask something. Mm -hmm. Let me ask something. I don't know the percentage, all right? But I'm assuming it's very high um, of the number of persons of Nivision and Sinkit's ancestry who are police officers or peace officers. I know the, the percentage of army officers are quite, probably quite high of, of Nivision Kittishans in that force. but. The boots on the ground, the peace officers, the police. I, I would almost hazard a guess and say the majority are now not of Nevis and Sinkis ancestry. You and I on that page. That, that, they may seem, you know, neither here nor there to a number of people, but it's important when you start to have the importation of, of non national peacekeepers, who are they going to relate to? Who they're gonna trust? You understand? Who they, where they're gonna patrol and people feel comfortable that they can have a conversation in the same dialect as they're accustomed to, right? A lot of times conflicts arise because people see these peace officers as outsiders. They're trying to throw their weight around or they don't understand, they don't. Do. It happens. I've had my run-ins with peace officers from down Winnet Islands, you know? And it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant. We are saying black people, but we, our cultures are different. Our understanding of each other is different. And you have to be sensitive about the kind of things that what is preventing nationals of Sankis and Navy from going to the police force? Have we really examined why? Is it, is it the living conditions? Is it the pay? I know the pay is pitiful. You know, what is it that preventing more of our own people from choosing law enforcement as a career. We have to examine these things on the route. You, you, see, those, you, see, you see those questions there? I, I would hope that when the, when the prime minister set up his town hall meeting, he bring across the police commissioner. And um, you guys would have a chance to ask that question because it's a serious question. You know, really? it, 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 it is unfortunate that we are where we are. I can tell you one experience I had. I had a book in, in my place in St. Paul some years ago. And I went to the police station and I reported it. And basically I did not 
get anything positive out of the police. So I decided, okay, I have my um, folks that could do their groundwork and get information from me because I have that respect in my community. And when I got my information, it was the person that I suspected. And I went back to the police and I told him, you know, and he asked me. And it turned out that that same police was dating a family of the individual that, that broke into my place. So instead of that police do what he need to do to bring the perpetrator to justice, he basically let him know that I am on his trail so he was able to discard my property. And I just found that I just leave it alone. I could understand why people don't trust the police because these are, these are things that happen. These are things that are happening. This is you talk to the police and before you get out of the police station, a phone call make uh, and you could be dead because you have evidence on someone. That's a black tackle rights. That's what I'm talking about. You have policing is very very important very very important but just as important are the personnel who comprise the police if the com if the communities don't have confidence in that officer or officers or the division commander or the sort or whatever it is you know and get nothing out of them they're gonna clam up they will not tell you anything right so while we are turning to the high command for answers, the high command themselves need answers right. as to why they are the way they are. Uh, but Adele, I don't know if you realize it, but we are hour and 37 minutes over time. Um, let me say good night to some folks. I have not been able to say good evening to my folks all night because I start off um, with, with a bang and um, I will give you an opportunity to say good night to your folk as well because I really don't intend to go past 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> you know, well, I, 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 was hope, I was hoping to just go until eight, but um, as usual, the conversations we have to have, if we're going to well, try and, and, and help with the situation, we have to have this conversation. When you have a cheap phone like mine, all I can see is you. I can't see the comments. I, I, can't know, I don't know how much people are watching. I don't know what they're saying. I, well, I hope, I well, hope it's oh, being positive. Okay. Well, you always get in positive vibes. You have a whole ton of fans online here saying good night to you. So when you get up and you and you go online, you will get to see them. As a matter of fact, I think it's about time that um you and Tulu and um but uh um Powell should get some kind of uh, reward with some device from the folks because you guys are um, on the job 24-7. Just like my device here giving me some trouble weekly, but I'm working with it. And by the way, I, I, I got to let you guys know, don't forget, I, I see that you guys are following instructions and you're doing it, but don't forget if you are not, uh, if you haven't already subscribed to the DJ Marisha channel on YouTube, don't forget to log on to YouTube, find the DJ Marisha channel, subscribe, subscribe and hit that bell because pretty soon that's where we'll be heading permanently is on the YouTube channel until there's something changed. So continue okay. to log on to YouTube, find DJ Marisha channel, hit the subscribe button and hit that bell. What we got some folks on like, like Loretta Clark Quilly, your good friend there, LCQ. LCQ, yeah. <laughs> she said good night. We have Tanja Powell, Chef Jefferson Lewis. Um, we have Jetty Taylor online uh, as well. Um, we got a whole bunch of folks here. Um, are you on a door? So she said, good evening, Mr. Daly. Um, Del Dish Delicious Nicholas mm. is online. Um, the regular crew. The regular crew, Gemini Nisbet, um, Gigi, Gigi, Gigi Williams. Yeah, your people are here looking for you. Um, we, ha we have my boy, um, I I I Ivor Henry. He I is the, yeah. The man, Elva, El, Elvin, Elvin, Elvin Ellie over in California. Elvin Ellie in California. He is a Claxton. Mm. We have um, a whole bunch of folks here. Um, I can't keep up with this thing. Tanya Powella, uh, Annette Morton, uh, 
I hope, I hope Annette is keeping up with the exercise. Angela Weeks. <laughs> uh, we, have, we, have, we have a whole day here. We have Thaddeus Depos. Uh, we also have uh, Mosita Pontin. We, ha we have a whole crew here. I kind of keep up with all these names. George Nisbet is someplace in, around the world listening. The man Elvis um, Williams, Lord Kent, Brother Kent, Glenn Green. We got Eustace Hendrickson there in the Houston area. We also have um, Everson Harris over there in Canada. A whole folks, bunch of folks here online listening to the to the chatter. You'll catch up with them following the um, thing. But I want to really um, thank you for taking the time out this evening because this conversation needs to be had. And um, I am hoping that the people that I saw yesterday was outraged of the killing of OJ and is upset. I see all of these, epi, uh, what do you call it, epistles and social <laughs> media. I see my boy Moira Box put out something nice there. I, I see my boy Larry Vaughan put out something. Fine. But when you guys are going to be that upset about the OJ situation, that is where I want you to understand when, when we are out there on social media attacking each other, it results in this kind of stuff. What starts on social media end up in the general public. You don't have to support a party to be nice to someone that supports that party. You could have a conversation without the fighting and the animosity and all of this stuff. We could have a conversation and disagree. Let us disagree and move on. I used to tell my, my partners, them, listen, partner, let's agree to disagree and call it that. Let's go drink a Heineken. That was my approach. Mm -hmm. Because no matter how you get into that argument, you're not going to change that person's trend of thought. You know? You might see things from a different light of what is taking place, but the realities are what they are. True. You cannot change the reality no matter how you try to turn it. I could remember just before the famous six got terminated by the farmer hog. I had Dwyer Astafan on this program and we had a good conversation. And Dwyer said to me, um, but Jeff Roy, election just finished. How you expect to get this government out before 2025. And I said to Doyle, I said, Doyle, you got some big stone around all road there that backing off the water to protect the road, right? I said, do you think I can pick up one of those stones and move it from there? He said, no. I said, but if I get a two pound hammer and a bucket and every night I go around there and chip off some of those stones and bring it and try it in St. Paul, don't you think I'll be successful at the end of the day one day I will move that rock? He said, yes. Well, he changed my name from Jeff Roy, you know, because when I accomplished my mission and the famous six was terminated, you know, you know do I change my name to? Troublemaker. <laughs> that is what he referred to me as now. And he's my friend. Do I is my partner. I mean, we're going to disagree on certain things because I'm still waiting for him to deal with the white color and the crimes that is being committed there in Nevis, with the airport event, the opposition office, the um, external wing there at the hospital. But you know what? I'm going to drop a track for baby Brantley and, and, and get something. So I don't know if you want to take a wine or your, your ham on the you drink berries, whatever you want to drink. I'm going <laughs> to drop this track here because this guy is as guilty as hell.
the daily guiltiness anyone that is doing the damage to their people that's been done there on the island of nevis they got some serious problem ahead of them mm -hmm. so, uh, people people have to wonder people don't need to wonder why is it that having raped the treasury since 2013 having accumulated vast wealth why are they still holding on to power and the simple reason is not the guilt, the simple reason is fear. They fear that once out of government, they'll be investigated and they will be prosecuted. That is what they're afraid of. And so they will do and say anything to delay that in, 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 in inevitability that they will be brought before the people. They will have to answer for the millions of gone missing uh, from these various projects, they'll have to answer as to why statutory corporations that are required by law to lay before the house, their, their audited, audited reports have not done so in over a decade. They'll have to answer as to the conflicts of interest regarding Mr. Brand, Mr. Brandley, Mr. Jeffers, all those who have been taking the government fleecing the government of Nevis for its resources. If you have a situation where ministers having served in government are coming out richer than they went in, tell yourself some level of theft, misappropriation or pilferage went on. Tell yourself that. You have ministers owning multiple multi-million dollar properties on a $10,000 salary. You have ministers building houses for their mistresses. You have situations where ministers have invested in heavy equipment and are selling their contracts to government. These are facts. And so anybody who believes that these guys are holding on for the benefit of the Nevis people are mistaken. They're holding on for their own personal protection because they know that investigations, a forensic audit will occur and they will have to be brought before the court to answer as to what happened to Navy's people money. Well, That's what they're afraid of. Well, you know, but, but daily, I mean, as you're speaking, my brain is just working in overtime, you know, and I got to drop this, this song and, and that, spe that speech you just dropped there because they are fools. If they think they're gonna get away with this, they are more fools than I think. And following this track, I'm gonna give you a chance to do your closing because I'm getting out of here. So stand by.
Yeah, Brother Daly, you are closing, sir. Well, then let me at first, in the first instance, thank you for allowing me some air time on your program. I thank all your listeners who would have been making commentary and those, of course, who would have sent greetings to me. And I, of course, respect that and wish them a pleasant rest of the evening. Um, I don't know, Jeffrey, why we aren't singing these songs that you play, the last two songs, why we're not playing them or singing them in our assemblies, in school, in our churches. I can relate more to these songs than any other song by Wesley, Charles Wesley or his brother. These are the songs we should be singing in our churches, in our social groups, in our prayer groups, because it speaks to what is happening. One line of the song just said, the destruction of the poor is in their poverty. Wow. How profound is that? The destruction of the poor is in their poverty. We spent this evening speaking about it. That nexus between poverty and crime. You cannot empower people by keeping them poor. You have to solve it. And since COVID, even before COVID, we saw a decline in people's welfare and an increase in poverty in the Federation of St. Vincent Davis. These are facts. These are facts. And until we start to reverse poverty, until we start to address poverty in a significant way, whether it's through affordable housing, whether it's through better education, whether it's through skills training, whether it's support for families, whatever it is, until we start looking at seriously at poverty, the destruction of the poor is in their poverty. They're gonna turn on each other. They're gonna turn on the rest of us. These are the, these, this is reality. And we have to accept it. Anything else, we just pissing in the wind. You understand? Until you get, you get politicians who understand that they themselves are part of the problem. That they see, they see themselves in a kind of vanity. They get, they get into power and they become discombobulated, they become um, distracted, they become disillusioned and become part of the problem. Look at what Brantley said when they were debating the bill, the, the, the uh, the, the anti-crime, anti-criminal anti bill or something like that. He said, listen, you're not gonna work. What we are doing here is an exercise in a checklist. And he checked them off. Integrity of public life, freedom of information, and the anti-corruption bill. It's a checklist. Checklist, that's how he described it. A checklist, not for us, your Nevis, but to satisfy, satisfy the requirements of donor agencies and those looking into our democracy. This is what he said. How is it that this and that brought widespread condemnation from the pundits and sinkings? The leader of the government here on Nevis, a member of the federal parliament can describe legislation as simply as a checklist, unenforceable. How? He can get away with such things like that. He speaks volumes of what people can tolerate. And you think the rest of the world are not listening? You think those young men who are killing themselves and killing each other are not listening? You think they don't see the dichotomy in our society, the unfairness that some get and some don't get? You think they don't see it? You don't think that you don't think that they see themselves um, have come to accept that they're less that they're, that they're less than they have nothing else to lose? They see themselves as less. They've been told that all their lives, you ain't gonna amount to nothing. Join the Pay for Peace program. Let me put a warning out to these young men who have been approached by politicians to join the Pay for Peace program. Your name is now on a database. Your name is now a part of a database owned by the government. And God knows who else they're sharing that database with. 
so they know who you are. They know your disposition. So when you try to get a permit, uh, travel, sorry, a travel a, a, a visa, and you don't get it, you have to wonder, did the Canadians or did the British or did the Americans see my name on a list somewhere? There are consequences for these things. The politicians are part of the problem because they're encouraging and supporting the poverty by not doing anything about it of significance. And the reason has to be, if a man is educated, if a man has a skill set, if a man is, in, is uh, have a business, he's now financially independent. He's no longer able to, you, you can't just go bribe him anymore with $200 or $300. You know how to come to him good. You have to come to him understanding, with, with understanding that, listen, I want to hear the issues. You can't fool me anymore. You cannot tell me nonsense anymore. I am now able to stand up to you on equal footing. But these guys don't want that. They don't want to lose that control over the poor people. The more people, the more poor people you have, the better it is for them. Which goes 180 degrees contrary to what they were elected to do, to make our lives better. Uh, partner, that's a mouthful. Um, well said. I would hope that everything they do is in 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 accordance with keeping themselves in power. That is the problem. For them to remain in power, you have to remain poor. That is the problem. And so I end here, DJ Moisha. Thank you again for allowing me this time. Well, thank you for taking the time out to come and hang with me this evening. Um, is there anyone you want to say good night to before I move on? Just a regular crew, the people who named already. And, um... I, I, I didn't name, I, you, you close your mic. I, I did not, I, 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 didn't name, I, didn't, I, I didn't name your brother, I didn't name Twilla. I'm pretty sure there's people out there that I didn't name. Well, my brother Denny, of course, his wife Twilla, and my brother Carl in Atlanta, my brother Steve in California, my sisters even in Judith in Connecticut, and my brother Hugh down there in St. Croix. Of course, you know, that's the tight-knit family we have here. So I do thank, I do thank you um, for allowing me the time for this. So but they can hear the little brother speak on matters that are important to Nevis. All right. Well, I, I normally say good night to you and Tulu and Carlisle, but I think you're here, you need to do that. Well, of course, I mean, I know Tulu is listening and, and if Carl is time permits, I know he's probably listening or he's gonna catch a broadcast, rebroadcast. So of course my two good friends, Carl and Tulu, special good evening to you. And of course my party leader, Dr. Janice Daniel Hodge and all the, all the other executive members of the NRP. Good night to you all. Uh, so my girl, dear sister, uh, Patricia Bartlett, good night, how are you doing? My sister Cicely Brown, dear Pastor Brown, I understand you're celebrating a birthday today. I hope you save some of that ginger beer for me, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> also my boy Carbo, I have not seen anything online for Carbo this evening. I guess he, he, he's relaxing. Carbo, remember to drop your information in the um, chat there so that we can um, get some folks across to Carbo for some of that good food. I also want to take this opportunity to Remind the folks of the Nivisions for Nevis um, breakfast um, next Saturday, the 17th of um, June, over there at the Castle Hill, St. Andrew's Church Hall at Castle Hill Avenue, 781 Castle Hill. Um, it starts at 9 in the morning, and I previously had said 8 o'clock, but I understand it starts at 9. Don't forget to support the cause. These folks have been doing a very good job for the divisions back home. So we want to big up folks like Twiller and um, Sister Hazel and uh, the boy, the President Gene Sider and crew. And everyone that uh, Sister Morgan, Vona Morgan and crew there, um, to Felix and those folks that are doing a good job trying to take care of the people back in Nevis. I also want to say good night to Gwyneth Marisha. I hope you're well. Sister Beverly Marisha, how about Sister Ann Farrell Smith, Sister Cora Bennett, my son, dear Jeff Roy Jr. in the LA area, and Sister Jazz, my sister Tartola, dear Esther in Tartola, Brother Mokish and the kids, Brother Joseph 
um, Jeremy, Jada, and um, Jordan. Also, my brother there in St. Thomas, Brother Carl Morris. Good evening, Sister Felicia Morris. Hope all is well. Brother Avon Brown, Sister Patsy Brown, Ma Ralph, and the crew. How about my cousin there, Brother Kent Bernier, Pamela? Thanks for all your support. Thanks for taking care of the, my sister there in Tartola. My uncle there, Eustace in St. Croix. My number one cousin there. My favorite cousin in St. Thomas there, Sister Natalie Carty and Caroline Connor. Bigging up sugars there in the St. Paul's area. The man Craig, the man Twinkie. Shabby, everything bang on. How about you and the crew there? The man Sassio. Well, Brother um, Daly, uh, time would not allow me to say good night to everybody, but I just have to say big up to my uncle there in Garvey's estate, Joseph Emmanuel. As usual, you folks know to check out but Uncle Joseph if you're looking for a place for parties, um, weddings, place to stay. It's there. My cousin Gloria there, Hutchinson, with her clothing, music festival coming up. Check out a clothing store there and here on Street, right across from the gas station there, right down Fourth Street, the main location as well over there in the old Simaco building and Central Street, right next to Skelec. They are still at the Jamarisha sent you. Also, check out my girl Laura Williams across there in the TDC Mall. She has some lovely stuff as well. Bigging up my boy, brother Austin Williams, the dancing commissioner, Commissioner Sutton, and um, my boy, the Julian. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, as I said, I cannot call everybody names this evening. I'm way over time. And I'm going to drop the unofficial anthem of the Federation of St. Kitts Nevis as I bid you good evening shortly. Sister Tracy Powell, good night. How are you doing? Sister Tracy Jeffords, don't forget, we'll be checking you guys in Sweet Sugar City shortly. This one is called Arise by the late great King Arrow. People. Mm -hmm. 